Wes Craven's new nightmare is the first horror movie that is actually about the frequently asked question, don't the people who make these films ever ask themselves about the effect the films have? It's very intriguing the way the film dances back and forth across the line between fantasy and reality. On the one hand, it's in the nightmare on Elm Street tradition with frightening dream sequences using scary special effects. And on the other hand, it's a look behind the scenes of Hollywood. It's smart, it's scary, and it's curiously thought-provoking. It didn't provoke a single thought in my oh, head. Come, come, no, come. no, 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 I don't. Roger, they put in these people who you and I know, and so it's kind of can't be fun to see them uh, in their real-life uh, roles on the screen. But th at the core level, this is a mad slasher movie with Freddy, who I have never enjoyed as a villain, and I don't enjoy him here. I, I, it's just the same old bloodletting with new it's actors. It's too bad that the movie didn't provoke a couple of more thoughts in your head. For example... Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. My real name, of course, is Freddy Cougar Town. And I am joined by Simon of the Cougar Village. Hello, Simon. Hello. And uh, is that like kind of um, what we're going to call the uh, 51st state when you kind of eventually annexes? Yep. Good. Good. I like it. We finally take back our God-given country called <laughs> Little England. <laughs> Not to be confused with the show. Hmm. No, that's Little Britain. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you could probably like fit it in kind of a corner of Florida. It is like a fucking model village by comparison. <laughs> Yes, Florida, the big, diseased, uncut penis, <laughs> or penis Alabama. Uh, it's just, we're big and we're beautiful, but mm. don't look at us with our shirts off. <laughs> Freddy Krueger, we're not done with him yet. We are going to talk about New Nightmare, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, uh, Freddy versus Jason, versus Chucky versus Michael, <laughs> versus the Leprechaun. And then we're going to talk about uh, the remake, probably the most anticipated conversation by the people who made the remake and still get royalties from it. So <laughs> they'll rush out to rent it. And I'm like, will they? Will they? You never know. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Let's talk about Wes Craven's new nightmare from 1994. Here is a frickin' teaser trailer from the television. How would you like to join us in the definitive nightmare? I thought you killed Freddy off. They told you he was dead. And since you've been thinking of making it, has anything funny happened? For uh, ten years, he's been held captive as Freddy in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And now he's got the last laugh. What is he doing? He's decided to cross over out of films into our reality. Cut the effect! Wes Craven's new nightmare. Miss me? Rated R. Starts Friday, October 14th. Do you feel thoroughly teased? Oh, yeah. Um, as usual, we're going to spoil uh, this. If you haven't seen Wes Craven's new nightmare, go do it. Do it, do it, and then do it again if you're feeling it. But cover your eyes, just like Siskel did. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah, we got this nice little <laughs> clip of... Uh, of uh, Roger Ebert and uh, Gene Siskel talking about this movie. And strangely enough, Mr. Ebert was really complimentary of this film and uh, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. ready to go to the mat over it because Siskel acted like he didn't even freaking watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and not only did he apparently, like you say, watched it with his fucking eyes shut, but he had like kind of... He was hallucinating, like, raining blood or something behind his fucking eyelids. He's talking about bloodletting, bloodletting. It's like, yeah, there, there is bloodletting, but he was, like, totally fucking, you know, it's like he saw a different film, you know? They, they front-loaded it. They front-loaded all the blood. Mm -hmm. Here is a VHS tape. I do not own this VHS tape, and I own very few VHS tapes, so I'm using this uh, new thing. It's called Google. <laughs> And it's the, this is the New Line Pictures VHS tape here. Freddy's back and... I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> Freddy's back and scarier than ever. <laughs> I am going to slur it. <laughs> Writer-director Wes Craven returns to the darkest shadows of Elm Street with his frightening film. Reuniting the stars from the original A Nightmare on Elm Street... This terrifying tale follows the sinister dream stalker as he slashes his way through the silver screen and turns reality blood red. 
Robert England, Heather Lagenkamp, John Saxon starring this white knuckle nightmare <laughs> with an appearance. This is my favorite sentence right here. This is my favorite thing. With an appearance by Nick Corey that will scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> what? And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. With an appearance by Nick Corey that will scare the daylights out of you. Like Nick Corey's appearance? Yeah. The tagline on the front of the box is a big lie. It says... This time, staying awake won't <laughs> save you. It's like, shut up. <laughs> yes. It's literally about staying awake, you bastards. <sighs> That's it. <sighs> one of the, one of the, the uh, quotes from the press on the back is, I didn't fucking hate it, Roger Ebert. <laughs> they should have put that there. So here we are, 1994, just to age myself. Uh, this is the year I graduated from frickin' high school. Yikes. <laughs> so I was primed and ready to go. This was the, uh, the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie I got to see when I could purchase my own ticket. October 1994, I saw this in the theater, and I liked it. I, I remember enjoying mm. it. Wasn't quite as satisfying to me in my, my teenage brain as... Freddy's dead was, but that's because I have <laughs> superb tastes in things. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, uh, neither Simon and I have no notes because there's no trivia. No one knows anything about this movie. Oh, no. Just it came out and disappeared. Uh, there's not. Oh, speaking of audio commentaries, big shocker, that frickin box set that I have, that terrible new line uh, DVD set of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies that just, I hate this set. I finally got to a disc that has a commentary track. Ah. Uh. This set is not like that cool one that came out before. This is the stripped down garbage set that literally has no extras until I finally got to <laughs> this movie that had an audio commentary. Well, um, by the sounds of it, because I'm trying to find, I've not managed to find the date of when he recorded it, but it sounds like it was like almost contemporary to when the film came out from some of the things he was saying. So maybe oh, nice. whether they did it for like a laser disc or, or something, presumably. That's probably exactly it. And yeah, I always, I always forget that that was the big draw for a lot of people with uh, laser discs was they had commentary tracks. That was a new, th that was a new thing back in the day. Uh, we've got people playing themselves. We got uh, good old Heather Lagenkamp uh, playing Heather Lagenkamp and fricking, uh, the mighty John Saxon playing himself, oh, yeah. uh, Robert England playing himself, and Wes Craven. And, of course, the screen sizzles with the face of Bob Shea. <laughs> hey. Um, and then someone else plays themselves as well. The producer. One of the, the yes. female yes. producers. Uh, yeah, her, she's female. I don't know why I said female. Oh, Sarah uh, Risher, Risher, however you say it. Sarah Risher, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I have to just tell you guys, she's definitely female. I don't know why. <laughs> Whatever. Just kill me. Uh, there's also a couple <laughs> other people playing themselves uh, mm. in a little bit role. I swear this man's name gets me every freaking time. Mr. Rod Lane. Mm. <sighs> Sue Garcia Jesu. Yeah. We did not figure out how to say that last time. <laughs> no, whenever uh, Wes Craven uh, refers to him, it is just as Nick Corey, which is probably so he's kind of credited it. Oh, so right. I don't know what the uh, the deal is there with the kind of two names, stage name, presumably. He's Mr. Garcia to you, buddy. Mm. Oh, my bad. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday Night plays herself as well. So we've got a nice, nice returning cast. Oh, Lynn Shea, of course. Uh, was yes. a teacher. She's now a nurse. Oh, in the trivia, of course, they were too timid to ask Mr. World Famous Hollywood star, Johnny Depp. And, of course, Johnny Depp later was like, uh, you should have asked me, dudes. Mm. I totally mm. would have it's made a, a cameo. Yeah, he didn't care. And it's bizarre, especially considering, well, of course, he was in Freddy's Dead. So, mm -hmm. you know, what the fuck? Duh. Let's see. Where do I even start with this? I'm going to preface this, folks at home. Marky Karloff, especially. Mm. I don't dislike this movie. Before I say anything else i do like this but at this point in our recording before we get to fvsj and the remake this is still holding the spot as my least favorite of the series well that's fair enough but <laughs> it's not that i don't think it's good 
It's that it's not for me. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, we'll we'll get to all this, you know. And I, like I say, I mean, a lot of my, um, you know, I'll even say kind of love for this is admittedly kind of predicated on nostalgia. But um, you know, that that aside, I can I can certainly see flaws in it, you know, which I'll I'll get to and kind of things that um, you know, they maybe should have done differently, and you know, so on. It is the smartest of the series. So this one and the first one, because Wes Craven was freaking brilliant, these mm. are both very smart films. And the rest are have neat ideas, but they're pretty stupid in, in other ways. So Yeah, yeah. But this is still one of my favorite series, so take that for what it's worth. That you know, it's my least favorite of a favorite. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing to say right off the back, as I think they say in the flipping trivia of all things here on IMDb, is it probably is the longest of the series. Oh, which, yeah. Which, you know, I will, I will concede right, right here, you know, that it, 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 it could have done with some trimming, you know. <laughs> this is also the, in the Guinness Book of World Records, the loudest motherfucking movie <laughs> ever made. Okay, folks, if you guys have it, an LG TV, uh, mm. I know I'm Mr. Fancy Pants with that exclusive brand. Wow. <laughs> we normally watch movies with the volume around 15, 20, a quiet movie's like 25. Yeah. We don't have external speakers or a subwoofer or any of that stuff, so we're just using the speakers that the TV comes with. Last night, I shit you not, I had turned the subtitles on and I had this movie at four. <laughs> It was. I was watching this at less than a third of the volume that I normally watch it, and uh, we'll get Jesus. into why. We'll get into my my other issues with this, which are actually legitimately a compliment. This is not a shit fest. We don't do that on this show. Oh no, no, no! Except not for so. that fucking prom night remake with the the prom night megasode, Brad and I. Oh boy. <laughs> That would be the only time where, you know, I, I can't and I will never back down on that shit. There's, I saw one person who was like, yeah, I think it's good. It just shouldn't have been called prom night. And I'm like, there's something for everybody. Look at that. Oh boy, you know, I, I need to buy the bullet and watch that because as I think we talked about, um, you know, uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, Prom Night, if pushed, that probably is my favorite slasher film, so I need to do that. Watch the remake and then have the first one ready to queue up immediately. You're going to need it. Oh, You're well, going to need oh, something <laughs> afterwards. Anyway. I appreciate that. It's not bad enough to be fun. That's one of the problems. That's a shame. But um, before I forget that, uh, what you were saying about the, uh, you know, the volume and all that, uh, I thought before that, it wasn't like super late when I started watching it last night, uh, but I thought, oh, shit, I have a couple of little satellite speakers and a little subwoofer. And I thought, yeah, I could probably watch it for a bit. But then it's like, I remember it's like, yeah, I'm going to have to be balancing the volume constantly and, you know, trying <laughs> to write notes. So I have a thing. It's, you know, if in doubt, chuck the fucking headphones on, you know. Yeah, you'll wake up the neighbors. Mm, mm, exactly. <laughs> New to this film, we have uh, Heather's husband in the movie, a uh, David Newsom, who plays Chase Porter. He kept his own name because uh, he likes the matriarchy. He should have taken her name if he was really smart. Mm. Uh, this dude, his company's called Cut to the Chase. He's he's an, a special effects dude, and uh, people even say the phrase. Let's cut to the chase. Oh, they do, yeah. Not referring to his company. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this dude, he's he's a special effects guy. He's secretly working on a new glove. Uh <laughs> <laughs> And it uh, the the scene is you know it's a movie within a movie or let me get this right movie within a dream within a movie within a movie etc. I'm not sure we get there's very clever uh, layers to this movie that I really like. So he's working on the new glove, um, and and Heather and her son are on the set, and of course the glove scares her, and then all of a sudden it goes completely crazy and kills people and ah, man i already feel like i'm getting lost oh no problem so and that sets up the whole movie that that nothing is real nothing is real from the get-go in this movie in fact i would love to do like a stopwatch to calculate in this movie the ratio of dreams to reality mm -hmm. 
because I this one never lets up with in and out of dream stuff. Yeah, there's some that I you know, I've seen this a bunch of times, but I just totally forgotten about even last night. And um, another thing I I don't think I'd ever consciously noticed until yesterday was um, the fact that there are no opening titles. And all that, which, um, oh, yeah. you know, kind of giving it, you know, you said Wes Craven, you've seen in the commentary, is attempting more for kind of an almost documentary sort of, you know, obviously trying to say this is, you know, reality, of course. And uh, apparently, you know, a tiny bit of trivia, they had to kind of, um, I think, fight a little bit for that, you know, with the Directors Guild, you know, to get an exception because that kind of oh. went against the, uh, you know, the usual kind of requirements there. Interesting. Well, you know, I did notice the aspect ratio. Hmm. The aspect ratio really just, for some reason, just it seemed to really open up and use the full frame. Mm -hmm. It's a one eight five one, and just yeah. something about that. I don't know why it, it it looked different to me than it did, from, especially from just having revisited um, Freddy's Dead. This one looked. Very good. I can imagine on Blu-ray that this one looks incredible. Yeah, the uh, the lighting, like I've got it on the background now, and all like the the night scenes, especially, are really really nicely lit. Um, the guy who uh, I suppose while we're talking about it, what was he? Um, oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, God, I had this before, and now it's totally fallen my head. Uh, Mark Irwin, who I believe he said uh, worked on a lot of Cronenberg's early films. Oh shit! I uh, know what else here. Uh, oh, some latest stuff. Uh, you worked on Scream. Oh shit! I forgot because I rewatched Scream recently, and I was uh, without getting on a big, big, uh, big tangent. Um, I think Mark Owen actually got fired off Scream, and uh, <gasps> yeah, because they were doing some the kind of latter scenes, and I think some of it came in out of focus, and there were some arguments. The whole production of that I was reading, I didn't realize what a clusterfuck it was. Partly because you know the Weinstein's <laughs> are fucking assholes. So yeah, he apparently got fired, and uh, Peter Deming, who's uh, David Lynch's go-to DP, uh, he ended up taking over. Wow! But uh, Mark Irwin, what else we got here? He did RoboCop two. I can't believe Videodrome DP on Videodrome. Yeah, man. Yeah, one of the best films of the eighties, right there. Holy shit! Oh, and how? Oh man. So yeah, good good call on that. I hadn't even thought of that. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Oh, there was another credit here I want to ask you about before I forget. Uh, apparently, I think him and uh, so the editor, Patrick uh, Lucier as well, uh, I think they both worked, or at least Mark Owen certainly did, uh, worked on Nightmare Cafe, uh, Wes Craven's apparently short-lived TV series, which I don't think I'd heard of until um, I was listening to this commentary. Are you familiar with that? I'm looking at it. I have four episodes. Mm. Robert England. What the... Well, now we got to track that down. Yeah, man. That sounds amazing. Whoa. Oh, my God. They got some funny CGI in the screenshots. Oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we need to find that. All right. Uh, but Patrick Lucier or Lucier. So oh, shit. shit. He, directed he directed Dracula, Dracula 2000. 2000. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. He also directed <laughs> freaking My Bloody Valentine remake. Oh, wow. And, uh, the, and Drive Angry. Oh, my God. All roads awesome. lead to either David Lynch or Nicolas Cage when Simon's around. Oh, nice. <laughs> Drive angry never goes away. <laughs> anyway, uh, so a special little boy in the cast. He's he's uh, Mikoing his way into our hearts. Mm. Is uh, good old Miko Hughes. Uh, he's he plays Heather Lagenkamp's. Uh, fun son, Dylan, mm. not to be confused with Dylan from Beverly Hills 90210, rest in peace. Oh, God, yeah. He is a child actor. Mm. Um, I, <laughs> God bless him. Uh, okay, let's talk about focusing on the kid in a, in a movie. Yeah, yeah. You got to be careful, folks. Mm. Now, I'm not saying this kid isn't a good actor, and he's he is definitely an unsettling young man when he's being creepy. Oh yeah. Um, one of the problems is we we don't see him being normal for a while and then getting scary. We cart we sort of vacillate between him being the almost the kid from Baba Duke to this kid. Which have you seen the Baba Duke, Simon? Yes, I've seen it once, and you know, it was. I found it very, um, you know, affecting. But that was kind of a one watch for life for me. Yes, yeah, same. Scott McDonald, he definitely pointed out something funny to me earlier. Uh, he was like, mm. "Yeah, the Baba Duke like kind of rips off New Nightmare by accident." 
Yeah. I and there's, so. a, there's even a few scenes where it's like, you just replace the kids. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just, man, this is the kid from Pet Cemetery, and, uh, he was the one, I don't remember Kindergarten Cop real good, but I think he's the one who had the tumor. And then Arnold was like, you have a tumor. And the kid's like, I know, I'm a <laughs> sick little boy. No, that's not true. But, uh, yeah, I, God, I don't like this freaking kid. It's, uh, I don't, I mean, not, not the, the actor. I don't like the performance. I don't like the, how much the script relies on him. I think it's, you know, I was wa- watching it again last night. It's very kind of inconsistent to me. Sometimes I think he's really good. Other times, uh, he made me laugh kind of in a way that I'm guessing is unintentional. Like there's a bit, uh, you know, where, uh, poor, um, God, what's the name? The babysitter who I have a bit of an, uh, trivia about her, which we'll, we'll get to. Ooh. God, what's her name? Is it Julie? Uh, where she gets killed, you know, kind of calling back to, um, you know, the kind of rotating, um, room yeah tracy middendorf yes yes sir now when that happens there's a bit where I, did you catch this this kind of reverse shot where they've obviously got a dummy of dylan you know just stuck you yes. know frog solid still and then there's a bit where cuts to a kind of close-up of him and he's like Whoop! you know kind of <laughs> <laughs> and it oh it made me laugh so hard and there's a, there's a few of the moments like that, but other times he can kind of be creepy. But it's it's just all over the shop. And I was thinking about this. It's a shame you couldn't have. Maybe it's kind of a time thing because in an ideal world, you know, every child actor performance would be like, you know, fucking Danny Lloyd in The Shining or something. But you know, you've seen that and you're kind of spoiled for life, really, right, aren't you? Right. Sometimes I'm really harsh on this film, and one of the things I used to harsh on was the presence of a kid so close, and it's not really that close at all, to when they made the Dream Child. Mm. The thing with the dream child, of course, is that the baby's inside her dreaming while she's awake. So she's being affected by the dreams. And this one, Heather Lagenkamp, is affected by the dreams because her son is asleep, but he's a sleepwalker. Yeah. And I used to be like, oh, Wes Craven just wanted to have another kid. He was jealous of part five, (laughs) getting to the kid first. And And it's not that at all. Like if you – in the – the issue of Imagine Movies, uh, this is Imagine Movies Fall 1994. Uh, they actually have Nightmare on Elm Street 7, uh, 5II on the cover, which uh, this, what was the title? Um, a Nightmare on Elm Street Part 7, The Ascension, mm. which I'm like, mm. what? When he was ascending yeah. into Cloud Freddy, when he was flying through the, the clouds? I don't fucking <laughs> but know. But I guess he kind of comes up through the bed a lot, but it's like... <laughs> You know what? <laughs> that just kind of sounded a bit wrong, but never mind. I love the sleepwalking angle. I love that sleepwalking angle. That's freaking great. And um, sorry, before you, I forget, uh, the kind of the first note I have here about the film is, and it's bookended this way with the credits, you hear the kind of kids singing yes. at first. And so I guess, you know, in a way, it's like the, the really, you know, I suppose it's kind of staying the obvious, but there are kind of two, you know, um, it's kind of two movies in a one, you know, and that you're seeing some of it kind of, through Dylan's eyes, although really more principally, you know, it's through kind of Nancy's perspective of him. I do love that aspect of the script is you, you imagine he and his, his uh, stuffed toy Rex, the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex fighting Freddy in their dreams. And that's a whole other movie right there. I like Absolutely. those parts of it. Uh, but in Me the too. interview in Imagine Movies, what inspired this film was literally lunch. Wes Craven had lunch with Heather Lagenkamp and asked her like what was going on with her life and certain things that affected her real life inspired this script, including her having a kid and her being, you know, like afraid for her child and and under certain circumstances and stuff. So it wasn't a ripoff of part five, obviously it was more about being real and true and giving Heather Lagenkamp, who was a mother, giving her a child on screen to kind of like, uh, use her fear, her real fear. Did it uh, mention about a stalker at all in there either? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that too. The, um, uh, Heather Lagenkamp in the movie is being is getting constant phone calls from uh, this stalker, uh, which they had died they had died off, but all of a sudden they start up again, and he sends her. Is it pages from a Bible, or what are the pages? I didn't actually um, kind of look close enough to see what it was, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. He sends her something ripped out of a book, and then a, a, a letter burned into it, and later it's going to spell out uh, New Line Cinema rules, bruh. <laughs> Very elaborate. 
And um, oh, sorry again. Before I forget, we're talking about the kind of kid angle. Um, Wes Craven in the commentary, some kind of interesting comments about it, um, saying that uh, you know, in in a way, you know, Dylan was kind of him, you know, when he was that age. Because I think when he was five, his father died of was this from? Um, I've not written it down, but I think he had a heart attack or something. He basically, you know, when I'm guessing he wasn't at home or something, you know, had people show up. You know, the house kind of like that happens. Yeah. So there's that and there's some other things as well that... Uh... Oh, there, there is... Um, uh, so you know how uh, IMDb used to have crazy credits? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, this one has a crazy credit. Yeah, and I'd look at it because I... Saying to you, I, I hadn't noticed until last night, the very end of the credits, this... Uh... <laughs> can read it out if you want. So yeah, near the end of the credits reads, uh, some parts of this motion picture were inspired by actual events. Others may be attributed to the overactive imagination of a five-year-old boy. Yep. The names of certain of the characters portrayed have been changed to protect the innocent. Certain individuals portrayed have been dramatized with the exclusion of those courageous individuals who portrayed themselves. Any similarity to the name, character or history of any person living or dead is entirely coincidental and unintentional. Exactly. That's the thing I was glad I left it going. I was like, ooh, What's this? And I was like, oh, Wes Craven. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of her husband, he, he gets killed. Uh, and another scene that reminded me of part five is uh, is him falling asleep at the wheel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With Freddy Krueger tickling his dick. Oh, and uh, <laughs> before that, I think I realized what is... Uh... <laughs> So it's so surprised didn't wake him up. That'd wake me up. Um, but um, I think his his mistake there, his fatal mistake, where I've got this written, was uh, you know, a PSA here, people, don't sing REM and drive. You'll you'll fucking die. <laughs> Unless it's something from like uh, Murmur or something. Oh, is that the early? They were they're like a, a grunge band at first, weren't they? They were really, really good. They were definitely uh, kind of, I guess I'd say, new wavy. Right, right. They had a new wave thing, but they were very unique in the very beginning. I and mean, they've always been kind of their own thing because hmm. Michael Stipe was like, "Yo, I've been wearing eye makeup for years. You guys didn't know I was gay." And I was like, <laughs> "I hadn't thought of it, Michael, but thank you." <laughs> no, I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, <laughs> what he should have done with the way you stay away while driving. Mm-hmm. Just start jerking off. Oh yeah, I mean you all um, you all drive automatics anyway, so you know exactly that way. If Freddy's tickling you and you get aroused, <laughs> you you fight off Freddy and you fight off making another Dylan. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> so he dies spectacularly, I might add. Mm. Of course, this proves to uh, to Heather that something's going on because his body's got freaking claw marks. And she keeps asking, well, what happened to him? What happened to him? Did you see that? It looked like he's clawed. And the poor uh, morgue attendant's like, he was in a bad wreck, lady. Like, it it was bad. It was so fucking silly. I loved it. <laughs> I think he was just waiting to get back to, you know, calling me completely unsurprised that when she walked in, he was fucking eating. Dude, I'm like... How is that in the screenplay? I love it. <laughs> but no, uh, so there's a funeral scene, and oh boy, the funeral scene is magnificent. Uh, oh yeah, let's talk about earthquakes. Oh Shit. yeah, yeah. Hmm. <sighs> Folks at home, I do not, these earthquake sequences, I'll give them this, they're very unnerving, hmm. but uh, they add to the volume, so I kind of don't like them. Right, got you. But this, this one at the funeral where... The frickin' earthquake starts, the coffin falls down in before it's ready to be lowered in. She can't find Dylan. Sure enough, he's in the coffin because he wants to be with Daddy. And uh, Freddy's got him. And she's pulling pulling him down in there. She dives in after, like a boss, Mm. to go get her kid. And man, I love this sequence. This is... This is like a highlight of the movie for me. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's quite kind of creepy, you know, with his um, coming back from the dead and does he have a little like blood tear or something like that? Yeah. He, yeah. Her husband wakes up and it's like, stay with me, Nancy. And he's crying tears of blood. I'm like, dude, that's brutal. Um, I, 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 this is the first appearance of Freddy's glove. Mm-hmm. We see Freddy, Freddy for a split second here. Um, and we'll talk about Freddy's look later. Mm. Uh, the first shot of the glove, I never, that's never sat right with me. I really don't like that angle. No, no. I don't dislike it's, the I design. Think I, I, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so I'm kind of torn on, we, we'll get to the look more later, but yeah, it's, I, I think it, because it's kind of, 
you know, they, they probably needed to kind of underlight it more or something. I don't, I don't know. I mean, they, they, they were saying, and again, without kind of getting too far ahead here, they wanted to make it kind of look less cartoonish. And sometimes I think they maybe ach- achieve that. Other times, kind of maybe completely fail at that. Um, and got more cartoonish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so eh, well, we'll, we'll nitpick later. Yeah. I normally, famously, I do not nitpick these things. No, no, and it's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just doing this just to, um, I don't know, for the sake of balance, I suppose. You know, it's not like a make or break thing for me or anything. Right, right. Oh, no, not at all. Once upon a time, Brad and I were doing the, the entire Halloween series. We did a mega show, super show, whatever you call it, mm. on the entire Halloween franchise up to the uh the rob zombie ones and brad was explaining to me how much the masks change and i never noticed (laughs) (laughs) one of my favorite touches out of the three standout things that i love in this movie well so far we got the funeral scene i love Mm. um the thing that blew my mind that i'd never noticed before during one of heather's dreams the camera zooming in on her sleeping yeah and they're moving the camera to kind of make it dreamlike, they're also moving every single piece yes. of furniture in the room. I didn't even notice that until I was watching the commentary before. It is really Dude, subtle. It's so well done. So good. I wanted more like that. There were so many things I wanted. Like, just just throw more shit into it. I love mm-hmm. that. Um, there's more I like. It's not just three things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am, I can only like three things because <laughs> I was born in Montana. <laughs> True story. Things deteriorate with Dylan leading up to one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Uh, (laughs) So Dylan is is really disturbing. Disturbing? He gets really disturbed and is frothing at the mouth, vomit-inducing, talking like Freddy, all this stuff. Has a fit. So finally, Heather has to take him to the doctor. Sorry, just before that, there was something else I hadn't noticed until last night. You know, what you're talking about with the, oh yeah, but you have the, um, the call back to the phone. Bit. Yeah. Uh, one oh, of, God, uh, yes, the, 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 the licking. Mm, I never <laughs> never noticed what he – like I said, I just wasn't paying attention or something. What he actually says, he says, ha, 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 I touched him. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> he he oh, didn't man. just say that. You know, I couldn't believe they could have threw that in. Okay, folks, here we are. We're, we're starting to double down on uh, Freddy being not just a child murderer but mm. a, a child molester as well, so – the innocence lost, folks. Mm, exactly. Innocence lost. Exactly. He's got his tongues all over everybody. Mm. Oh, well, man, we'll talk about the tongue scene. <laughs> so she takes him to the doctor. He's completely catatonic, just nodding, like barely. Like, I guess that's not completely catatonic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> He's just nodding and like staring at her with his mouth open. This kid never shuts his mouth the whole movie. It's kind of like me, mouth breathing all over everything. So, re- <laughs> so relatable. And uh, she literally gives him permission to play on the freeway. (laughs) She's like, see that over there? That's our house over that freeway. You have to go over the 205 (laughs) and then you're going to have to actually cross the 450. I don't know. I don't know Los Angeles. So, but yeah, she's literally telling him to go play in traffic. I fucking love it. (laughs) I thought you might. Well, we get the who is the doctor in this? I'm oh, well, really the main like... doc, the main doctor. Oh, she's brilliant, and there was an amazing uh, bit of trivia about her uh, about the genesis let's of her see. name. Let's, let's talk about her, and let's talk about Frank, the Julie, the babysitter. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Fran Bennett, uh, she plays Doctor Hefner. Yes. Oh my God, she's she's Mrs. Hugh Hefner. I don't know whether you, this is in the trivia or anything about where her name comes from. No, let's hear it. I have no idea. Uh, Wes Craven says it was his backhanded tribute to a guy called Dr. Richard Hefner of the MPAA, who he describes as the bane of his professional life for many years. <laughs> because, um, well, you can imagine why. Um, and wow. interestingly, though, this was one of the last films I think he kind of oversaw. And kind of ironically, there were no cuts to this at all. They just got a clean R, no problem. That is so amazing. And Well, I mean, it is, it is uh, as Siskel said, raining blood. Mm-hmm. No, this is yeah, this is so <laughs> one of the least gory ones. Yeah, this that's funny. I mean, so much so they had to. Um, I think New Line they had to kind of insist on adding some more stuff in, like you know, uh, doubling, you know, kind of leaning into uh, Chase's demise and stuff like that. Exactly, dude. That's so funny. I love that. That's great. Fran Bennett was in a movie I would love to revisit from the '80s uh, called How I Got Into College. All right, uh, it's a kooky 
college comedy dudes trying to get in um 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 speaking of all uh, roads leading to Nicolas Cage one of the other films it says she was in what's that uh 8 millimeter apparently she's good at the really serious roles so i'm not surprised mm. yeah cuz she's just great in this movie oh, but man. um yeah. she's uh not trusting Nancy, excuse me, Heather. <laughs> she doesn't trust her at all. She's so convinced that she's been showing uh, Dylan the movies, uh, which this movie kind of flirts with um, the effect these movies would have on people. Yes. But what it, that's yeah. a red herring for what it's really about is the people working on these movies, the effect it has on them, mm -hmm. which is very cool, which leads to one of my all-time favorite moments in this, which we'll get to when we talk a little more about John Saxon. Mm. John Saxon has, I think, the best the best moment in the movie that I love very much. Right, Julie. Speaking of David Lynch, I mean, when do, when do we not? <laughs> She's played by Tracy Middendorf, who I like very much, and for some reason, I just think she'd be a Lynch girl. She would be yeah. in a Lynch movie. Oh, she's in Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> just kidding. That that's not a Lynch thing. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> oh, no, boy. I really like her. What else was she in? Well, she's in the Scream TV series. Awesome. Uh -huh. yeah. Or the Screamies. <laughs> That's not. No one called it that. Please help me. <laughs> uh, she was on Millennium. So, uh, yeah, I'm not really seeing. It was mostly TV in it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, she, uh, she's Beverly really Hills 90210, apparently. Oh, Six man. episodes. Oh, man. That show is such a huge part of my freaking tweeny teeny teen teens and another one uh that's uh well kind of going more ahead and more to present day i suppose one episode of murder she wrote <laughs> that's right oh my god i bet uh if uh Lieta had been awake she'd been like she was in murder she wrote and i would have been like oh damn Brilliant. nice call good call uh so of course they recreate the scene of uh Oh my God! What the hell was Tina? Mm, <laughs> Tina's mm. scene where she gets killed on the ceiling. This one they definitely toned it down. Oh yeah. Uh, there's there's a shot where she's getting killed and there's not a drop of blood when she falls to the ground after getting stabbed. They think they should have reshot this moment where she's laying on the floor and she is distinctly not bleeding. Then the next shot, there's blood everywhere. I'm like, whoops. <laughs> Woo. That's when the editor is going for the continuity of the scene, like the action of the scene, not the continuity. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in the commentary, calls out a couple of the um, uh, continuity areas. I always love it when directors do that. And funnily enough, I've just I've had the film on in the background. I think I'm just about up to that scene now. Nice. I want to talk a little bit, before we get to Freddy's uh, sexy freaking uh, leather pants. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the acting stylings of Wes Craven mm. uh, and uh, Bob Shea. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Uh, Bob Shea, God bless him. You know, he is not an actor, but he's been doing this. He's he's had a cameo in like every freaking movie just about. Uh, but he has a moment that I really liked where uh, Heather finds out from him that Wes has been writing the script and that's what's stirring up all this shit that's going on. Uh, m literally millions of dollars of property damage from these fucking earthquakes, oh, all God. because Wes yeah. Craven has to write a fucking movie. <laughs> Selfish bastard. He's telling her that, you know, he's working on the script, and that's when she has is taken aback and is like, oh my God, have you been having nightmares? And Bob Shea just mm. looks stricken for a second. Yeah, yeah. Like like that thing, he doesn't want to talk about it. I'm like, oh man, that's so good. Good on you. Oh, doesn't want to answer his phone either, does he? No, I didn't. Who does? <laughs> oh, God, the phone's ringing in this movie. Mm. Dude, get a freaking new ringtone, you fuckers. Oh, my God. Uh, but the, uh, what is it? Uh, he was uh, the bartender. Oh, yeah, and two, I think. The guy, do you say a little like Gene Simmons? <laughs> <laughs> the Gene Simmons imitator to uh, Big Hot Shot Hollywood Man. <laughs> There should have been a whole series of just, and Bob Shea as himself. Oh, man. Yeah, I wish. But I love Wes Craven's acting. I love his yes. voice. I could listen to him talk about freaking the production of bread and like <laughs> industrial yes. machinery. Or so. I, he's so fascinating to me. And, and listening to him talk, he's so good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like I like when he puts his hands in his pockets. That's just fun. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's doing a character thing. Or maybe he just puts his hands in his pockets sometimes. I would with Heather Lagenkamp around. Wow. <laughs> um, but, oh, God, and Heather Lagenkamp is so good in this. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, she, she, she's um, really... Oh. Wes Craven was saying, you know, kind of going back to um, 3, for instance, you know, how 
I, I forget what he said. I think he thought she was a bit, not necessarily wooden, but kind of under or maybe misused in that. And, you know, all th- I think for the, the purpose of that film, you know, and her kind of purpose within it, it, it works absolutely fine. But then, you know, you can, you compare it to the first film and then especially to kind of this, you know, how much kind of range she gets to show. And it really is. It's like yeah. night and day. She's really good. Uh, but I was like going to say something about, oh, and, uh, John Saxon, of course, playing himself is just gorgeous. Mm. Because John Saxon, I think, has always been himself <laughs> yes. in movies. He's he's a little bit like Shatner. I love it. Absolutely. And there's a um, before I forget, there's a scene. You know, whether in the park, um, which we might talk about. So that kind of I always find that scene kind of hair raising, just from a potential health and safety perspective. But I found after I found out how it was done, where Dylan climbs the top of the the slide, the the rocket, and tries to mm. tries to grab his dad from heaven, and oh. I'm like, I was like, God didn't want me or something. Oh I'm man, like, it's oh so. My God, that's. That's how I feel. Mm. Every day, man. <laughs> I hear that. No. But um <laughs> I, I even before that I was I was getting nervous last night because it's like John Saxon he sat in a park in the middle of the day on a bench and luckily he's got, you know, Heather Langen camp with him, but I was half expecting someone to come out of nowhere and fucking stab him. You know, because I've obviously seen Tenebrae far too many times. Nice. Well played. Oh thank you. <laughs> man, Peter Neal, right from the uh, <laughs> the nice ties group. Oh, he's still among us, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I'm just waiting. People, just just ignore us. Just ignore <laughs> us. If you if you're still paying attention to us at this point, you are truly screwed. Oh boy, yeah. Let's talk about Freddy's look. Now, I know a lot of people really like this, and I am like Freddy Krueger, fedora plus trench coat. Mm. This is a giallo, folks. Oh boy, yeah. I just I just have never gotten into this quote unquote Freddy is darker, Freddy is scarier. No, I mean I, I just yeah. don't I don't see it. I don't hate it. I don't there's no Freddy makeup I hate in all of them. But this is easily my least favorite where I just don't get it. The glove the the skeleton glove is brilliant. Mm. But I think th- there was ahead of its time in terms of CGI. Now of course I'm, I'm Mr. Practical Boy. I want things to be done with models, and I want things to be done with makeup. I don't want everything to be CGI. But can you imagine if they green screen that shit, and then his hand was literally the musculature the, and the bones, the claws fused to the bone? Yeah. How yeah. brilliant that would look that now. Would awesome, that would definitely. be fantastic. But I see what they were doing, and I like it on paper, but it just... Yeah, the, like you said, they kind of didn't get the non-cartoony vibe. No, they the execution of it. They kind of dropped the ball a bit. And generally, overall, it's like I I am really hit and miss with it. It's weird. It's like last night I was thinking, yeah, I really don't find him kind of more scary. And then like weirdly, I was watching the end of the commentary today, and it's like, yeah, maybe sometimes. But um, yeah, for me, still uh, number two is the one I've always found him kind of creepiest in, which is yeah. weird, you know, considering the general tone of that film. <laughs> When they have Robert England come out as Freddy Krueger in the movie, in this movie, yeah, when he's when he's on the talk show with the 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 brilliant another brilliant scene is when uh, she's getting freaked out seeing him waving to his fans and stuff. Mm. Great lighting there, yeah, especially all the all the kids in the background as well and he's cheering, kind of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like they would. Mm. He looks so much better to me in that moment. Than this Freddy. Now, I'm not saying Freddy can't be different in this movie. Obviously, he's going to yeah. be different because he's not Freddy Krueger. He's taking on the guise of this 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 creature is taking this on. I think the overall problem is it's like they they kind of almost didn't it's kind of like what you saying with the glove and now they didn't kind of visualize it to you know with the rest of the arm and all that to kind of enough an extent. It's like they didn't go far enough to differentiate him and to make him yeah. into this more kind of primal abstraction, you know, kind of, of of pure evil or what have you. I mean, you you get it at least in the... I like how you look at his eyes and all that, and it kind of... I'm, I'm presuming, you know, unless I've dropped the ball here on, like, research, that it is Robert England behind those, you know, probably some other contacts. But it kind of, you know, they did enough to kind of make it not look like him almost. I'll give them that, but yeah, still... They tried it's... to bulk him up. They want to make him more muscular. And I, th- I think Robert England was just in really good shape. Mm-hmm. At this point, too, because he looks, like, really good in this movie. Mm. Mm. (laughs) Freddy is always hard to look at, freaky to me, always. Mm. Mm. One through five, six, 
the, especially the freaking remake. I can't even look at that. <laughs> uh, that freaks me out for real. That freaks me out. Cool. Um, I don't remember. I remember him. I don't watch Freddy versus Jason very often, mm. <laughs> but, uh, I'm trying to remember like what he looks like in that too. But and so there's no time where I thought he'd gotten cartoonish. I think the movies had gotten cartoonish. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that's enough about Freddy's look. He's beautiful, leather pants and yes, all. Yes, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's just not my favorite. That's fair enough. On my tombstone. I mean, it wasn't my favorite. It's kind of like the um, <laughs> there's a refrain. Um, oh, there's well, there's two, I suppose. You know, people calling out people's names in horror movies. You know, that's kind of like a cliche in itself. And where's this in the? This uh, was kind of such a um, important piece of trivia. It's mentioned twice in the IMDb trivia. I'll go go to the bottom. So it's probably easier to find here. Yeah, this is verbatim mentioned twice. Where the fuck is this now? It's in there so often you can't find it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the character name Dylan is clearly spoken a whopping 103 times, but um, holy, you know, is more just kind of you know expected. The one that cracks me up though is the nurse and how often she has to say like every sentence. Miss Langenkamp, Miss Langenkamp. Just in case you think it's Nancy, bro. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the hospital scene, uh, I love when Dylan pukes up that whole bag of licorice he ate. Oh, oh boy. I forget what he said it was. It's like some mixture of some kind of various soups. But there's a bit of trivia here, which I'm kind of... Uh, was this mentioned about the flies, apparently? Oh, there's supposed to be flies in it? Yeah, yeah. Um, where is this? Um, yeah, he said apparently they released 3,000 flies as well, but they didn't show up on film, which seems crazy. Not even on the Blu-ray don't show up? No, no. I mean, I have to go back again and look. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm kind of potentially calling bullshit on that, to be honest. Maybe maybe that was in the, the, the planning. Maybe. And they tried it. And if they even filmed it, it definitely didn't make it in the movie. Holy shit. No, there's something weird about that for sure. I wrote in my notes five words. The highway scene. No thanks. <laughs> Big no thanks. What did you have the volume down to on this one? <laughs> no, I seriously, this, I did not like this scene in the theater when I was 17 or 18. Yeah. And I really, I really still don't like it. I think it's neat. Uh, Freddy in the clouds is ridiculous. Him teasing the kid with uh, cars hitting him where he's raising him up and down with his giant claw. That's hilarious. Like that's some seriously <laughs> demented shit. I, but that, I, that much I appreciate the shot that I love in it that they can't show for very long because of budgetary reasons is when Dylan sees that, um, that cloth barrier that's stretched along the yeah. highway. Cause of, I'm assuming Los Angeles is just like Tampa where the highway is always fucked up all the time. <laughs> And oh, there's yeah. hundreds of Freddies running towards him on the other side. And as soon as they get close enough to where you can see how cheesy the 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 mass produced Freddy mask is, they immediately cut away. So they couldn't do a mm. lot there. But I just love that's a really horrific, like something your brain couldn't process. Like, oh, I'm scared of this man trying to kill me. Oh, good, he can multiply. Hooray! Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that, but. Uh, the rear projection, the CGI, and it's, and it, and like you said, dude, it's fucking loud. Oh boy. I never noticed, by the way, before I forget that that's kind of, you know, the bit in the clouds. And I suppose even the kind of, you know, he's throwing him around like a puppet. It's kind of a callback to three, I guess. There is some callbacks to three. There's, um, there's two effects shots in particular that are, are callbacks to the movies three, three through six, stuff that only you'd see in three through four. Five, I guess, more about because six had less of the stretchy Freddy. Stretchy Freddy. That's a beautiful <laughs> phrase. I also wrote in my notes literally right after the no thanks. I said, tempted to just watch this on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> folks, I apologize for going here too. I don't really like the score. Now, I haven't listened to the score for this by itself, so I might like it separated from all this volume. Mm. But some of the cues um, from our pal, our buddy, because, uh, of course, the composer returned, uh, J. Peter Robinson. Um, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wait. No returning. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. 
they use the music from the original for a brief moment. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, in the in the opening of the movie, and but then this guy comes in, and yeah, I just man, I yai. Not a fan. I just don't like the score. And now I I I I I, 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 I do not listen to a ton of horror scores. I tend to accidentally listen to the same 20 scores over and over again. Got you. <laughs> like, uh, like just real quick off the top of my head, uh, Day of the Dead, I listen to the original Nightmare score. I listen to The Burning. I listen to a lot of those, a lot of scores like that. But I, I just don't listen to a lot of the Nightmare on Elm Street scores. So I don't really know how this compares because I don't remember the score from six. I don't really. I remember that was it was four the one with the carnival music or was that five that had the carnival music? Um, oh God, um, let me see. Well, I remember. Th- I remember. Listen to our previous episode for that answer. To be fair to us, it's been a while. I mean, I can tell you off the top of my head. You know, obviously, um, you know, number one being uh, was it Charles Bernstein. Number two, uh, good old Christopher Young, and number three, Angelo Badalamenti. Of course, I'm not going to forget that. That's right. Um, and number let's that. look because now it's going to bug me otherwise. <laughs> Craig Safan. Yeah, I mean, between four, five, and six, it's like when you've not immediately watched them, it's more liable to kind of stuff that's more liable to kind of fall out of your brain a bit. I I will say I quite you know I quite like the score for this. Um, oh, good. You know, I I was listening to part of it when I was um, getting ready before. And I'm I'm kind of quite familiar with it anyway. There's some of the kind of motifs I, I you know um, think are really really good. You know, like um, one I suppose that's associated with with Dylan's kind of a uh, you know very childlike kind of um, I want to say not wistful. I don't know. You know, it's got a very kind of gentle kind of um, kind of tone to it. But yeah, I mean, it is very. Um, was the word you'd use with this movie before kind of strident i guess it's very like Rawr! yes you know but um even like listening back to it on its own there are some you know nice kind of textures and various dynamics and stuff but um yeah i um there's one or oh, two movies that i also know this guy for or am i wrong about one of these i could have sworn he'd done the he did the gate yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd seen that one, and that makes sense because listening back, yeah, it definitely feels obviously as you'd expect of a piece of that. I thought he did some of the music for Ghostbusters too, but now I'm seeing. I think I was wrong on that. Uh, although I think maybe he did the music with somebody else. I'm gonna have to look that up now. That's gonna bug me. But yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, it, all things being relative, it isn't. You know, um, it's not like a patch on like the first three, for instance. He did the music for everyone's favorite Return of the Living Dead too. Ah, no, I do quite enjoy that one. Now I want to hear the soundtrack to that. I'd rather listen to the soundtrack to that than watch it. Not even for uh, good old Dana Ashbrook. <laughs> oh, that's oh my god, I forgot. Yeah, I I think my brain tells me that I'm going to enjoy Return of the Living Dead too now because I have not seen that since ninety two, ninety three, back when I rented it. Yeah. Oh man, you know, I I think um, I'm kind of hit and miss with number one. I have to be in the kind kind of right mood for it. Oh god, it's so bleak. Yeah, well that that's it. And there's like I don't know, it's weird. There's so, there's some of it that you know, like the whole um, when they're having rigor mortis and all that. It generally makes me a bit fucking queasy. That is, uh, <laughs> but it's it's good that it rides that you know that razor's edge of of you know kind of comedy and horror. That's one of the things that's brilliant about it. But in a way, I think I'd probably find number two more rewatchable. It's kind of weird. Well, hold on. You're telling me you don't like when the human body gets hard. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) But of course. (laughs) Please kill me. So (laughs) let's talk about my favorite moment in this freaking movie. So John Saxon, he's playing himself. He's he's Heather's uh, father figure. She whenever she's scared, she goes to him, especially after her husband dies. She's she needs somebody in her life. It's stable. So he's always there. He's always at her beck and call helping out offering advice, stuff like that, uh, buying her red pumps that she can wear. Yeah. Hey, Tenebre. Hey, Macarena. All right. So <laughs> he has a moment where near the end of the movie, his exit scene is my favorite thing ever. He's at her house. Dylan is missing and she's asking for him for, for help. And all of a sudden he says something she doesn't really understand. And he turns to leave and she follows him. And as she's following him, she spots something on his belt. I mm. never look at his belt. Always look below it. <laughs> he ha- He's wearing his freaking badge from the original film and his gun from the original film. That's when you realize he's wearing the entire outfit 
that he's pretty much wearing from the first film. And she's wearing the same uh, night shirt, uh, pajamas. Yes. And that's when she realizes he is fucking trapped in the movie, too. Love it. That is my favorite scene from this movie. I had never noticed that before. This was maybe, oh, God, maybe my fourth viewing ever. So there's probably a reason why I missed a lot of these details. <laughs> and that's when she just, they both just echo the original dialogue from the original. The original dialogue from the original. Originally, they were going to echo the original <laughs> dialogue from the original. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so good. That and when, uh, you know, she um, basically sort of, you know, when she's obviously clocked it and it's like, well, I'm kind of invested now and I have to kind of play the game as it were. She, you know, you see her kind of almost like the cogs turning of like recalling the dialogue and says, what is it? You know, I love you too, daddy, or something like that. And that's the moment where Freddie kind of emerges out from the, uh, you know, the ripped, um, you know, sheet. And it's like, right, yeah, it's on. And um, yeah, when she turned around and you see that original house and the, you know, the motif of the original theme plays, oh man, I get chills. It's, it's so good. Unlike the remake... This film references the original properly. Mm. And we haven't even gotten to the remake yet, boy, but I'll tell you now, the things they try to recreate from the original movie, that's the weakest parts of that shit. But I'm excited. I'm ex- I am legit excited about the rest of this this conversation with the, the other two films. It's going to be something. Something's oh, going to happen. Me too. I mean, it's a long time so since Freddy vs. Jason and god, um, forever oh my god i've only ever seen one once and i think that was probably on a bit of a muddy looking um like dupe or something to be honest oh boy yeah so we'll see we'll see okay <clears throat> uh let's talk about pill pop and nancy uh nancy does my favorite thing ever uh there's this theme of uh fairy tales there's this theme of uh hansel and gretel and breadcrumbs, leaving breadcrumbs so she can find Dylan when he's lost in dreamland. And he, he in the, earlier in the movie, he didn't take his sleeping pill like he's supposed to at the hospital. He hides under his pillow. And so he leaves her a trail of pills to find him. And she's just like, oh, here we go. Pop, 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 popping pills. I wish that scene had gone on a really long time where she'd taken like 16 or 17 pills. Like, Heather, no, <laughs> just follow the pills. Follow them. You don't have to look. Oh, she's taking them. That would have been great. She goes into Never Never Land to see uh, Peter Pan's um, tights. Oh, yeah. No, we finally go into Dylan's dreamland, which is basically, I guess it's it's this is Freddy's domain. This is the, the demon, this nameless demon that uh, Wes Craven was hinting at. This is his domain. Mm. So you see things from Rome... And you see things that are ancient, like uh, pillars. You see freaking dinosaurs because, of course, that's something that is either a reference to how ancient this dream demon. Oh, we're back to dream demons. Is is <laughs> fuck? It's either telling you how ancient this demon is, or it's just literally Dylan's obsession with dinosaurs spilling into the dreamland. Oh, good call. Uh, I love this matte painting she falls into. I adore the sets, and I, this is one. The moment when I was like, ah, shit, I wish I had the Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. Because I'm like, I bet this would look even better. Because these sets are great. This whole ending sequence, long-ass tongue notwithstanding, I really love this part of the movie. It's it's pretty damn oh, good. Man. This final this final showdown is definitely worth the price of admission in 1994, which was very cheap. From what they were saying, um, and just from what you see on screen as well, um, yeah, you would have loved to have been there on set because they were saying it was like a hundred foot set or something. It was like a mini factory going, you know, with all this stuff. And uh, even before that, when they get there, I, I, before I forget, um, it's kind of um, foreshadowed this, I guess, like a few things um, early on in the movie, you know, where uh, Dylan's got, you know, the, the dinosaur at the end of his bed under the covers and all that and uh yeah i i always kind of appreciate that so i remember you know i'm sure many kids uh did you know like if you, you you go under there with a torch or something or make it into i don't know like a fucking uh cave or um something like that just your imagination takes over and you can imagine it yeah. being this kind Brilliant. of portal to another world and uh yeah yeah love the uh, the whole transition to that when uh, nancy obviously finally takes the plunge kind of quite literally man it's so great um, so the tongue scene, I okay. There's there's two things that this movie does um, that reminds me of. It's the continuity between 
parts three, four, and five, and this, which is the rubber reality that uh, Wes Craven talked about. He, um, he, no. They bring in the part where uh, Freddy wants to eat Dylan, and his mouth extends, which uh, it still disturbs me. Even though you know you can see, you know, in the age of DVD, you can really see how. I'm sure the Blu-ray looks even more uh, telling as to what the effect shot, when the effect shot starts and stuff like that. But I love that where he's trying to literally consume this kid. I think it's brilliant. Um, But I really, dude, this tongue scene, (laughs) I think there's something in the trivia about how difficult it was. It took like two days to film, apparently. It took too, too many. I I (laughs) wish they'd done something else. And that's just my personal preference. I I don't want to, you know, I don't want to disparage the freaking amazing people who made that shit. Mm. I'll I'll talk shit about some other movie. (laughs) But (laughs) I just, I miss the tongue scene. I'm like, why is this movie two hours long right here? This is, that's where I felt it. Well, yeah. I mean, but, and then of course, Freddy uh, defeated, turns into the dream demon whose eyes pop out. I love that. I was like, that should have been in the 3D. That was great. <laughs> oh, it, it totally took me back to the end of the six. And I, I think I rewound it about two, three times last night. So I was trying to get, the first time it made me laugh out loud. And I went back, it's like, well, no, it looks, I think it looks good. And then like, third, I was really not sure what I think about it, but that just makes me love it even more. <laughs> Man, you're doing good. You're doing good. Uh, so, the thing about the movie, the, 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 the denouement here, is so they get out after defeating Freddy. Great scene of her reading the script. She finds the final script with a note from Wes. Uh, the theme of the movie, which we didn't, re- we kind of touched on a little bit, didn't really discuss per se, was that it's the storytellers that keep the monsters at bay. It's because we keep these things alive in fiction that they don't become real and destroy mm. us, um, which is what explains the Wishmaster movies <sighs> and how we're in this hellscape of 2020 <laughs> is because they stopped making the Wishmaster. Oh, boy. No. Let's just say I have not revisited the Wishmaster movie since the first one. I've never seen the sequels, but I've been wanting to rewatch the first one for years because I've probably not seen it since, like, VHS. Yeah, I think... We should probably both do that because I yes, have, I did it. not I hated it when it came out I don't I have a feeling I won't hate it now but it was okay. yikes um, so yeah it ends with her reading the script because that's how you calm a, uh, a hyper child as you read from a fucking screenplay to them interior night like <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you have any other uh, trivia about uh, the 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 it's any trivia that you want oh, to... Oh, well, let's see. Um, or key oh, scenes right, yes. we skipped. Uh, well, let's see. Just have to bear with me. I'll squint my notes. I have highlighted stuff there. Oh, so early on, um, speaking about the earthquake, there's so many callbacks to the first film in this. One I hadn't noticed was, uh, you remember in the first film, very early on, Tina suggests, oh, maybe an earthquake's coming because, you know, they say things are going to get really weird. If oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yes. it was like that. Oh, and they used real footage. They used actual uh destruction from the 1994 earthquake is it the earthquake happened while they were making the movie they're like hey production value as brad would say it's called production value richard exactly and uh you know Wes craven he makes a good point about how that you know kind of uh has this other um i suppose kind of function of just saying how again just kind of unstable the kind of foundations of things really are you know um you know not just in terms well yeah literally in terms of i suppose reality i suppose um <laughs> I like what you did there. Oh, I, I don't even know what I did. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I think I, yeah, I think I did. <laughs> I'll know when I listen. You know, you intended. It was intentional. We'll, we'll say that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, so did you find uh, Nick Curry's appearance terrifying then? You know, like, it's proper stuff the uh, <laughs> I, back of the VHS. <laughs> I literally had to think. I'm like, call back to the beginning of our discussion. Exactly, like ten years ago. Can you imagine, like, just if they'd gotten Johnny Depp mm. and him, they'd finally have reconciled the the gay stuff with those two characters. Oh boy, you know what he was trying to do? Flicking that knife out of him, don't you? Oh yeah, he was flicking his dick at him. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also next to him, I don't know why, <laughs> because they were in the same fucking shot why uh, Nick Corey was meant to be terrifying, but Tuesday night wasn't, because she was right fucking next to him at that funeral. Oh! Oh, that's wonderful. Um, 
surprisingly, uh, this is, of course, the lowest box office returns mm. for, for all of them. I'm, I'm actually surprised. I think people just weren't into Freddy in 1994 because even though this was, this is crazy, this was a million dollars less to produce than part six. Oh. I mean, I think that's why Wes Craven had the career he did because he could be like, law of diminishing returns, no problem. <laughs> So this made 19 million. It's the lowest of them. It, it did make its money back. It looked like it doubled its money worldwide. But yeah, I was a little disappointed to see how my my dollars in 1994 didn't help it more. That's a shame. I mean, um, I think one thing uh, Wes Craven was saying in the commentary, the site like kind of the audience had changed by this point. Yeah, also kind of the landscape mm-hmm. of like film and all of that. Um, and I thought about this again with, you know, the, the, the focus on like kids so much and how in a way, you know, some of the gore side, this could almost work as like kind of a kids movie, perhaps, or kind of a good gateway for people into the series. And I'm trying to remember now, because it's so long ago, of course, which film in the series I saw first. It's entirely possible. I might have even seen this before I ever saw the original. I mean, I, I could be That's wrong. That's amazing. Um, yeah. but I mean, it is, it's possible, you know. Wow. And, um, so yeah, you have like the kids who are obviously, you know, begging the parents to, you know, take them and all that no doubt um and also you know the people who had watched the original you know are now all 10 years older and maybe some of them have their own kids and all of that so with few exceptions let's be honest about the mid 90s mm. the mid 90s for horror what was and i'm not talking about the indie stuff the smaller movies the the gems that have since come to light mm. internationally uh the mid 90s was terrible for mm. horror it just wasn't it wasn't a very interesting time no i don't know there wasn't a lot so it's not really a surprise that something as good as this wouldn't do well Mm, absolutely so let's see yeah onto the trivia so what do we have from uh the commentary uh i'll just try and go through this quickly so yeah again all the stuff about earthquakes um yeah the original opening was meant to have an earthquake and be much kind of more expansive but you know they weren't able to do that but he, he kind of considers it sort of fortuitous i suppose because it's nice they have that um you know kind of again calling back to the uh the first film you know with them filming the boiler room scene and all that and uh you may have seen about this i don't know the earthquakes were written in before the actual one so Again, yeah, thanks, Wes Craven, for that. He created danger. Indeed. Oh, somebody else who's in this. We were talking about the nurses before. Did you see about, uh, I think it's Jessica Craven. She's one of the nurses. Oh, cool. I think the one that uh, accidentally, well, not accidentally, she, uh, after a bit of misdirection from, well, that poor third nurse, who not only does she get punched in the face by Julie, she got, I think, elbowed in the stomach for real by Heather Langenkamp because she was that into it. (laughs) It's such a traumatizing blow that she falls out of camera. (laughs) Oh, that's it. Like I say, you know, apparently for for real, just old Heather, she was going method that day and it wasn't written or anything. She's like, fuck it, you know. Yeah, she had to settle out of court on that one. <laughs> that's no fucking doubt. brilliant. Indeed. Um, was it you saying over dinner they had talked and, you know, had taken some of her real life experiences into into this? Uh, some of it, they kind of had to pull back a bit. She kind of had some reservations about the closeness to her a real life but um yeah. yeah generally speaking yeah obviously she was she was totally up for that um oh i got um this is not really trivia but just kind of more uh kind of a trope i know you like good old swimming pool at night glimpsed all too briefly yes. and I, oh. apparently they shot that in slow motion you know you've got that lovely um you know the rippling light on the outside of the house and um yeah i love um mm, the fact oh, they yeah. shot it in a real house you know and all the, the kind of atmosphere around that you know it has a real um, appropriately sense of reality to it, which again, you know, is a good foundation for, uh, you know, when you're starting to uh, bend that at the edges and all of that. Um, what else we got? Oh, we were saying before about the uh, rocket, uh, old Miko, he ends up, uh, well, not him, he didn't dive off. It was a 13 year old, uh, kind of very short for their age circus performer who ended up diving off it. <laughs> but they still, he was stood on top of it, as you can clearly see. And that was a combination, I think, of what's a steel armatures, doubles. And, uh, but the kid himself, he said he was very athletic, you know. Um, um, what else do we have? Nice. Oh, I mentioned about Dr. Hefner. Oh, random thing, just about, because I was wondering, it's like, when they go to Wes Craven's, is that his house? Um, no, apparently not, you know, with that uh, just <laughs> oh, amazing sure. fucking uh, swimming pool. Oh, yeah, he he almost has one of those infinity pools, but it's like, it's like a... Mm. 
Just this really nice house. That's so funny. Of course, he didn't fucking live there. Oh, that reminds me. There's another one that these, uh, you know, even more kind of. Well, I don't know what West Craven's real house looks like, but they. Uh, he said we decided on a real kind of baronial looking house for Robert England, even though apparently he lives in some kind of informal kind of beach house, you know. Uh, so, but they just that was just kind of the <laughs> the image they had in mind for him. But uh, anyway, in uh, Wes's so cool. uh, not house, they brought a load of uh, of his uh, of his stuff over, you know, from his office and elsewhere, including. Um, this is not related to anything. I just found it interesting. There's a silver statue on the table, uh, the coffee table from Sitges. Is it that Spanish film festival that he says he thinks? I don't know if this is true. It's sculpted by Morricone's brother of all people, which Weird. is uh, kind of uh, intriguing. I real I love his painting. I did. We didn't mm. mention his, when he's being creepy on the phone and then disappears from the movie entirely other than you know the robert england portion of yes <laughs> disappears the painting he's doing of the new freddy is oh man it's so good I it's love really it. well done it, yeah it reminds me of some of the really cool art they did for the uh the poster for the first one mm -hmm. yeah this reminds me to look at the wikipedia page for this as well because we can talk about the kind of uh, polarity of responses to this but for the people involved anyway you know Wes craven he's saying at the end of the commentary says it's one of his favorite films he's ever done you know for personal nice. uh, kind of reasons you know kind of coming full circle you know the obvious nostalgia and all that uh the kind of freedom he was given by new line and the lack of censorship which we mentioned and also um because there was some kind of business shenanigans in terms of i don't think he was cutting in percentages on this the um the sequels and all that and uh, bob shea just right off the bat you know he was saying you know is there anything we can kind of do to kind of right any previous wrongs and you know all that kind of bad blood was uh kind of exercised there so saying yeah, it was kind of quite a kind of healing and quite uh you know meaningful experience for all involved which mm. was really uh you know nice to hear and yeah that reminds me related to that uh do I have this on the wikipedia page good old robert england says where is this that um Yes, there's a new Nightmare. It's Robert Englund's own favourite Nightmare movie, which is interesting considering, you know, kind of how... Well, I, I know he's in it quite a bit, but I mean, kind of re again, relatively speaking. Um, so, yeah, there's a quote here from him, an interview from 2012, apparently online. Uh, he says, uh, I think it stands the test of time, a fun reunion with original cast members like Heather and John Saxon. Where's his script? is clever and original, the self-referential horror story, which, you know, that comes to... I know he did, and I've never seen this, he did Vampire in Brooklyn the following year, but then after that he would come and do Scream. And I, I've always thought this um, film kind of falls a bit, you know, to me, kind of in the shadows of that uh and though with some of our friends um uh, uh on facebook and uh, friends of the show they had some comments about this which i'm sure they won't mind me mentioning i'll come to in a minute but um yeah there's a quote from heather langenkamp here as well saying yeah she's also very supportive of the movie saying i was just really shocked i was in the movie so much i had totally forgotten i was the star of that it was interesting we saw my scenes are kind of alone and i was acting against this tension and the idea of freddy that we all had at that time we all knew what i was afraid of and that freddy might be back but you never really saw freddy that much and i was amazed that the movie was about Wes creating this relationship with that idea that Freddy is here and the audience has it too. It's a really interesting concept and one of the only horror movies where the monster is really in the background, at least until the end. But it's all about our mentality about fear, which I think, yeah, that kind of um, is kind of on the money. Nice. I think a lot of people say this is the bridge to scream. Like yes. this is yes. this is him perfecting his craft and making this thrill ride, this never lets up thrill ride. But folks, let's be fucking honest here. This is not a bridge to scream. This is a bridge mm. to Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, I gotta watch it now, don't I? Uh, I've seen parts of it. I've seen parts of it. Okay. I wouldn't mind be now that I've I've been like watching more of uh, Wes Craven's films. I haven't seen like I saw Red Eye finally. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, that. Which I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Um, but I don't think I'll enjoy Vampire in Brooklyn, I'm sure. I, I'm just... Well... Eddie Murphy just ain't my guy. Well, that's fair it's enough. And when it's described as one of his, um, you know, kind of weaker films, that doesn't bode well. But uh, I, I quickly glanced at the Wikipedia page for that and saying it has, you know, developed a bit of a cult following. But then, you, again, you could maybe say, well what movie hasn't at this point but no i i, I obviously pluto I nash man pluto <laughs> nash that's the one that's the one you want the haunted mansion <laughs> man, I, I still can't i still can't believe that disney messed up i hope they just redo it yeah because was it um del toro he's saying he wanted to do it yeah uh, no i didn't know that but yes please the haunted mansion mm. is such 
a wonderful ride. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they added, like, one thing from the movie to it. <laughs> and it ain't Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Oh, dear. But um, should oh, I... I don't think they'll mind, will they? We've got um, some comments on my uh, Facebook post from yesterday from uh, old friends of the show, uh, Martin Luther Presley, Tyler Miller, and Marky Karloff. Yes, um, I apologize to all of them for how much I've been dissing this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I hope you know they haven't they haven't bailed on us. It's like I'm sure they know how we roll by now. And now you know, not it's yeah. not just me and you. It's you and I know you say you and Jeffrey and pretty maybe even you and Brad as well. You know, and uh, you know, um, and you and Nafferal have you know riffed on a movie and it seemed like you're kind of taking the piss out. And then we say, how do we feel? And oh, shock horror, you know. Um, anyway, dude, before we move on from mm-hmm. freaking. Heather Lagenkamp. Oh, yeah. Speaking of people who should have been in a Lynch movie, mm. I don't know what it is about her her get up when she's going to that interview, when she's all dolled up for the interview. Yeah. I can't not think of her in like, maybe not Lost Highway, but maybe like- um, Mulholland Drive? Yeah. I could just totally see her as like one of the characters in Mulholland Drive for some reason. No, I, I totally see that, man. I don't know why, I don't, I, but I literally thought of that yesterday. On Miko Hughes' um, IMDb page, this year it says currently filming, although, like I say, with everything currently going on now, who knows, uh, we have Dylan's New Nightmare, an Elm Street fan film. Ooh, nice. No, I hope that gets done. That sounds fun. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, yeah, poster looks fun. Um, so yeah, you can kind of imagine what that will, will be. But uh, anyway, to the old Book of Face. So um, yeah, Martin Luther Presley says, um, he always been a fan of this one. Still as original as it was, Scream still feels like a breath of fresh air, where New Nightmare, at least to me, does not. Maybe in the context of the franchise it does, but not in the genre. Maybe I'm talking nonsense. I want to watch it now. <laughs> I do, you know, as I said to him, I kind of, I kind of know what he's saying. I mean, it's not, you know, I, I, you know, I may as well say now, yeah, I do, I do love this film. You know, again, a lot of it's nostalgia and other things. Just at this point, I've seen it that many times, you know, what's and all and all that. But, um, yeah, it's not, it's not Scream. I'll give it that. You know, I, I don't, it doesn't have the <laughs> same rewatchability to me, but, you yeah. know, they are also quite different, you know, at the same time. Uh, Tyler says, uh, seriously, one of my faves. It's a little too long. Yeah, totally agreed. Uh, but otherwise, so wonderful. I love Freddy's new design. Love the evil doctor. Love the spooky kid talk. And that ending yes. shot, them reading the screenplay, gives me goosebumps. Yeah, wholeheartedly agreed with all of that. Uh, and Marky Karloff says here, there's a few bit of correspondence between him and Tyler. The bottom of this, but uh, He says, uh, I was stunned to grow up and find out people didn't care for this one. It was one of my absolute favorites as a kid, and it's definitely tied with the other seven as my top favorite in the series as an adult. <laughs> tied with the other seven. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Marky was the first person I thought of when I was talking about the things I don't like about this movie. I felt bad because I always thought this was a big favorite among people. Mm, mm-hmm. I thought this was like one that everybody who's a big Freddy fan really loved. I hadn't, I didn't oh, no, think people no. didn't like this one. So I thought I was this, being um, weird. Mm. No, not at all, sir. And, you know, again, I, I can totally see, you know, any of the kind of criticisms here, like there's another guy on, um, let's see from, I don't know, this was contemporary or, you know, kind of retrospective, a guy from entertainment weekly, um, he says, after a good gory opening in which Freddy's glove nearly designed with sinews and muscles slashes the throat, the special effects guy has been working on it. The movie succumbs to a kind of sterile inertia. Wes Craven's new nightmare isn't about Freddy haunting a film set, which, mm, uh, which actually might have been fun. It's about Heather Langenkamp, star of the original nightmare, being menaced for two long, slow hours by earthquakes, cracks in walls, and other weary portents of doom. And, um, I, I'm a bit hit and miss with that, but, uh, one thing he says here, which I, hmm, kind of half, maybe quarter agree with. He says he describes it as an empty hall of mirrors that lacks the trans-like dread of the original. I maybe, yes, somewhat, because like you said before, that really has that kind of consistent, you know, kind of diabolical atmosphere. It, it, do, it yeah. maybe has one or two moments like that, but it doesn't have it, you know, it's like kind of a, a smidgen of it, really. No, um, and he, he, can, he can kiss something that's <laughs> inappropriate to kiss about the empty hall of mirrors. Yeah, no, this is... Yeah. There's so much more to this film than than that. Yeah, I mean, someone kind of conversely underneath that was saying, you know, called it kind of a meta horror masterpiece. I might not call it mm-hmm. a masterpiece, but certainly getting the jump on the whole meta horror thing. You know, what two years before Scream? So yeah, and like I said, I this is my least favorite in the series until we get to Freddy vs. Jason mm-hmm. and the remake. But um, it's not because it's not good. It's because mm. it is really 
effectively tense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this movie puts you on edge. Yes, totally. Because it is a roll. It's it's like definitely a roller coaster of a movie, um, and that part that part I really respect. And I love the smart touches. It's super freaking smart. I love that shit. I love the intellectual bits that are in there and the callbacks and all that stuff. But like I said, the, the volume, um, the kid, the focusing on the kid, and I guess just the freaking volume. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And also, um, you know, kind of one thing I suppose about the tension and all that, you know, obviously um, a selling point for the film in itself, but in terms of just something that's made, you're going to be more enjoyable to rewatch... You know, it's not going to provide that kind of same purpose as, say, you know, a lot of the sequels are going to do. So, yeah, you know, but exactly. um, yeah, again, kind of apples and oranges, isn't it? Hmm. Um. So, dude, do you have anything else before we move on to uh, Freddy versus JJ? I've I've said way too much already, and I don't think I really <laughs> we both have. How I really feel about this film? Oh, oh man, we have. We we've gone kind of uh, almost balls deep Doom Show 1.0 on Woo! this. You know. Uh, hello, this is the Balls Show. No, um, <laughs> and hey, I, if there's ever an episode where I just backpedal and try to not hurt anybody's feelings, it'll be this one because I just, mm. yeah, this is. Um, I hate to admit when I don't like something on the show because I don't like to harsh anybody's buzz on something. No, you got to be honest though, you know. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I really think it's funny. I think it's funny when people are like, "I hate liars." Hmm. And I'm like, why, dude? They're just people who didn't tell you the truth. It's not like a thing. <laughs> anyway, here, <laughs> here is the freaking te- teaser trailer for Freddy vs. Jason, a.k.a. the thing they tried to make a long time ago. And we got the masterpiece of Jason Goes to Hell. Gain his power. Come to Freddy. He turns to an unspeakable evil. Wake, Wake up, Jason. Mommy wants you to make them remember what fear tastes like. Now that evil, Freddy used Jason, is turning on him. Why will he die? Freddy versus Jason, rated R. Okay, folks, that was the teaser trailer for Freddy versus Jason, the only movie. Starring uh, the lady from Destiny's Child. What's her face? Oh, I forgot her name. Oh, um... Kelly Rowland. Taylor Swift. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Wow. She changed races. (laughs) I waited for her to change genders. Oh, man. Well, you know, I mean, transgender is so last week. Now it is all about being transracial, isn't it? Dude, I'm trans species. Fuck you. <laughs> what? But let's just not go down that road. So uh, Yeah, I think we lost some listeners there already. Uh, Sorry. This <laughs> We didn't have them. Uh, we are talking about a movie from 2003 directed by Ronnie Yu. Hmm. Um, funny story. At the end of the movie, his title came up, Ronnie, directed by Ronnie Yu, and Ronnie... De- Lietta looked up at the screen and said, Ronnie, you bastard. <laughs> well, so good. that's uh, uh, funny. She, sh- she should have said that yeah, because that will come into some of the uh, trivia that I don't know whether hey, you've... Uh, yep. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, we'll get into that when we get into that. Definitely. I did something special for the plot of this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went ahead and found the plot on the back of the uh, Chinese DVD. Since oh Ronnie Yu. Uh, is Ronnie Yu from Hong Kong or is Ronnie uh, Yu from um, mainland? I'm curious. Yeah, Hong oh, Kong. Yeah. There you go. You know, he brings a Hong Kong flavor to this series, boy. Oh, and how. I mm, love it. Mm. Oh, oops. I showed I showed my hand a little bit. It's it's a complicated love, as we'll get into. So I took the Chinese directly off of the, the description and ran it through Google Translate. Oh, wonderful. Into English. So First of all, I am not making fun of Chinese people. I am not making fun of the Chinese language. I'm making fun of the ridiculous crap you get when you run it through Google Translate and you kind Mm. of break it. My first temptation was to translate it from Chinese to to English to Dutch and then back into English again. But I was like, you know what? It does have to be somewhat readable. So here we go. Things you need to know. Freddy 
translates to fatty, (laughs) F-A-D-I. Jason translates to what I believe is Ji Zun. So I'm going to do my best here. You ready? Go for it. Fatty, the Mangui Street, who specializes in breaking into people's dreams and killing people in dreams, has been in hell for 10 years since he first killed people in dreams. (laughs) The villagers of Mangui Street have systematically deleted Fatty's memory and wiped him out. All those who have the opportunity to become the targets of Fatty's hunt have accepted drugs to control them and no longer dream. It seems that Fatty's conspiracy is completely unsuccessful. In order to escape from hell and make trouble in the world again, Fatty used a Jason, the Fierce Ghost King, Friday 13. That's so beautiful. The Fierce Ghost King. Oh, who killed him without blinking to kill him. I think we have some lyrics in the making here, man. You know? Yes, we t- Gyro Jets coming through here. Okay. I got, I'm sweating. I'm excited. Ooh, all right. Fatty entered the dream of Ji Zhan. Suddenly he's not Jason anymore. To resurrect him and borrow a knife to commit murder. <laughs> Which caused panic again and created a rare opportunity for Fatty to escape from purgatory. <laughs> Unexpectedly, Ji Jun was killed out of control and Fatty was not willing to attribute all the credits to Ji Jun. And Ji Jun was not used by Fatty. In addition, the villagers of Mangui Street want to differentiate them from it, <laughs> causing both defeats. The battle between ghosts and ghosts is more intense. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm Ugh. sorry, folks. I That filled me with utter joy. That is like my favorite thing I've ever done in this fucking show. Oh, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh my god. And you just reminded me about the whole thing about Google Translate apparently predicting the apocalypse. I had to pull this up here. Um, I think there's a few variations on this. but <laughs> So what? what is this? From, oh, my namesake here, Simon Moraudo um, on studentedge.org. Google Translate predicts the apocalypse when you write dog 18 times. There's just a picture of a dog open mouth going soon, dot, dot, dot. So firstly, he says, uh, make sure you set the language to Maori. Okay. Um, and they're saying, yeah, it's funny because Google is saying don't be evil. Uh, so like, I'll just skim past this. <laughs> so for instance, look what happens when you attempt to translate dog 15 times. From Mario to English, so we have dog 15 times, dog, and then to English, dog, 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 reader email. Not so weird, but then add one more dog. So we got dog, 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 you get the idea. And English, Doomsday Clock is three minutes at 12. We are experiencing characters and the dramatic developments in the world. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, it gets better if you write it 18 times. Um, is Yeah, same thing, but then uh, in the world, which indicate that we are increasingly approaching the end times in Jesus' return. Well, apparently, dis- oh, it's dyslexic. Ah, they, yes. They think it's someone typing God a bunch of times. Oh, yes. oh, sh- ah. That'll do it. That'll do it. Mm. Uh, let's talk about some key scenes from this insane movie, mm. and then we'll talk about some... The the epic trivia, which we're going to have to, like, be careful because this may mm. have the most trivia, man. I mean, I know that somebody wrote an entire book on ni- the first Nightmare on Elm Street, mm-hmm. which is wonderful. I recommend that book. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Never Sleep Again mm-hmm. by uh, Tommy Hudson. That's T-H-O-M-M-Y Hudson. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a fantastic book. So, yeah, th- that has a lot of trivia. <laughs> Cool. I will pick <laughs> so that's that up. a detailed production book. Oh yeah, and it was, it was super cheap when I got it. So yes, yeah, highly recommended. Nice. Um, but this this could have a thing. The issue with this would be like a he said, they said, she said, he said, they said. Like it's so yeah. There's a lot of disagreements, but yeah. Oh boy. Hold off on that. So and I think we we might have to contact our lawyers before we get into it as well. And also, well, actually, no, forget <laughs> fuck that. Let's just again, you know, we'll put quotes around it. Like said, he said, she said. We are not saying any of this. Right there you go. We will definitely get sued for our controversial opinions. Mm. So uh, we got Robert England back as Freddy Krueger. Now we have a controversial, speaking of controversy, casting of Ken Kersinger oh, yeah. as Jason Voorhees. He was a stuntman, uh, a Canadian dude who played Jason, and he's continued to do stunts. Um, I don't know how much acting he's done. Oh, no, he's been acting quite a bit. Yeah, yeah quite a lot of it. What, 60, 60 acting credits, well. Wow quite a career for him 
Uh, but yeah, Kane Hodder was supposed to play Jason, and there was a bunch of controversy because they just didn't want the Ronnie Yu just didn't want. And yeah, that's he said what it he was down to too short and too bulky. I think. Yeah. So they picked this tall dude, and they did a different thing. Hmm. Hmm. Freddy plays a narrator, and he's got shark teeth. Hmm. So gonna... Freddy has mm. two distinct looks in this, maybe more. Where, well, obviously Robert England gets to play him without <laughs> makeup a few times in this, uh, but he also has this demonic, like literally Freddy the demon. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's funny that I was when I was watching that, I thought in some ways if they'd gone more for look like that for New Nightmare, that might have been more effective. It was kind of freaky, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was definitely uh stepping up the game over like just it was such a it looked like such a complex makeup. Even the eyes were just they looked painful. Mm. The 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 eye uh the contact lenses look crazy. He's narrating, he's telling a story. We're going to have people explaining what's going on a lot in this movie. Yeah. And we don't need it. We're good. But that's okay. Mm. Yeah, no, <laughs> so... <laughs> it was definitely more complicated than, I, than I'd remember. So I said to you, it had been years since my last viewing. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it all comes together quite neatly, I think. Exactly. Uh, we got um, a girl uh, skinny dipping naked in the nude <laughs> at Crystal Pond. Uh, crystal, uh, crystal estuary all that sex fog creeping around will do that to you yeah. you want to take your clothes off man this girl is so amazing i don't know who this actress is but she is built for mm. action like her thighs are so muscular she has to be a swimmer or a fucking pole vaulter or something crazy mm. but i was just i was like holy shit dude she's gonna fucking murder jason with her thighs she's gonna snap his head off i love her <laughs> um so Jason's mommy looks different. Another um, point of contention was uh, they recast Jason Voorhees' mother. Sorry, Richard. Just just hang on one moment. Just sure. one sec. I just want to take my headphones off a sec. I think. Uh, sorry, my mum's been watching some uh, opera stuff on the TV. I, th- I think. Oh, I, <laughs> I might totally, watch it again. Yeah, it's not. It's not coming through on this end. Oh, well, that that's okay. And yeah. Even if it does, I suppose it'll just add to how <laughs> fucking weird this is going to be. Okay. <laughs> It's, there's a torrential downpour going on here, so I can clean that up too. Hey. Oh, cool. So, cool. so yeah, they replaced right. uh, Mrs. Pamela Voorhees uh, with another actress. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what is the name of the original? Oh, Be- Betsy Palmer. Thank you. God. Uh, they replaced her with uh, Paula Shaw. I believe this is Paula Shaw. Yeah. Um, this is also controversial. They, yeah. they could not get Betsy Palmer to come back. She was like, what are you going to pay me? And they're like, well, kind of nothing. And she's like, no, thanks. Yeah, that's what I'd heard at first. And I was scanning the trivia before. It said she didn't want to do it. So whether that's somebody uh, from the studio going on IMDb and whitewashing it, I don't know. But yeah, yeah I'd heard they were just being cheap as fuck. Yeah, and, yeah there, was, there, was two, there was two things that her, her manager eventually said, her manager, her, uh, her agent hmm. eventually said, she doesn't want to be remembered for only that. But yeah. It really was just they were going to give her peanuts. So mm, that's just not right. Whatever. Whatever. Both stories are true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Pamela Shaw's fine. Um, I don't mind her. She's been in a lot of stuff. Dude, she's still working to this day or until 2019. So she's doing good. I don't know about you, man. I'm kind of disappointed they didn't get Polly Shaw. <laughs> <sighs> Purple sticky punch, buddy. <laughs> Fuck. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, How dare dude. you invoke. The frickin' the what is it? Son in law? God bless America. Man, what's he doing now? Who cares? So <laughs> I find that Pamela Voorhees a little uh, manipulative. I'm like, lady, mm. let your son grow up. Let yeah. him take a break. But you know what's more important than that? Mm. New metal. Yes. New metal is cool, dude. Oh, so 2003, man. It was uh, <laughs> when I was kind of uh, getting ready for this. Yeah, I've been listening to some stuff I hadn't like heard in years, and just looking back at the uh, looking back at albums that came out that year, and uh, there's a lot of covers I ain't seen for years, and it took me right back. So I, uh, I think my first part time job actually I worked in a record store, and uh, yeah, I just remember it, oh, just kind of almost like a uh, Proustian thing. Is some of seeing these covers I'm not seeing in like wow. That many years, like God, yeah. Wow. I have. I'm gonna go ahead and say some of these might be new metal and some of these aren't. I'm just gonna go through. We're gonna say we got Spine Shank, mm-hmm. got IMX, we got Machine Head, got something called Smitty, Typo Negative, 
Uh, I know typo negative is not necessarily new metal. Oh, but hey, kill, switch, engage. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Uh, Chimera. Did I mention Il Nino? There's a band called Il Nino. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, this is this is crazy. This soundtrack, I am not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the grunge, the fake grunge from, uh, from uh, Freddy's Dead. <clears throat> Oh, it, yeah, it also took me back to, uh, you know, when I did, still used to go in nightclubs about when I was in college. Just, uh, well, there were a few. Uh, there was one, what was it called? Uh, Aquilenium. I used to... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Go to on, like, uh, was it a Tuesday night? They had a student night. Um, and there was another one that's still about, that's been in Preston for years, called The Warehouse, which I remember going there years after I'd left and just like, it's like they're still playing the same stuff, but it's like now everybody's younger than me. It's like, this is depressing. Let's <laughs> just leave. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, boy. <sighs> it's retro night. No, we just have the same CDs. And yes, they're <laughs> CDs. We don't have the MP3s. Mm. Catherine Isabel is in this. That blew yes. my mind. I completely yeah, me too. Mm. forgot she was in this. So Catherine Isabel is, is a horror movie treasure mm. uh, of good old Ginger Snaps and many other things. American mm-hmm. Mary I like very much. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing about her is very funny. <laughs> they got the most redonkulous uh, body double for her. Because <laughs> clearly she's like, I am not getting naked in this movie. So yes. Dick. So they just found someone with even larger boobs because she's very well built. Mm. Uh, lady, she's stacked. But man, they said, no, no, no. We need boobs that don't fit on the screen. <laughs> boobs. So they got this, bless this, this body double's freaking heart, man. It was crazy. Mm. Uh, I wonder, like, who gets fooled by that? Like, I guess teenagers don't. Man, whoa! Blunt monkey freaks. Yes, blunt monkey freaks. People sitting on Pete's crotch. <laughs> she utters the immortal line, "Don't be a total cocksmith." <laughs> yes, which means that cocksmithery is welcome. Oh boy! And is uh, was he wearing a trench coat? That took me back as well. We always used to wear oh, trench coats boy. in college. Oh, brother. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to go ahead and call out a thing on this show I never talk about. The costumes, the, the the people's clothes in this are so distracting. Movies get dated by weird shit for me. And I'm going to go ahead and say the straight off the rack gap clothes, like the straight off the rack <clears throat> freaking uh limited express whatever like whatever these people are dressed in yeah they look so new everything that everyone's wearing looks like it's brand new yeah and they i don't know what it adds to this like thing i can't unsee and mm-hmm. it never stops bothering me for some reason <laughs> yeah no i know what you're saying oh yeah. boy I'm not going to go into just how irritating. Like, I just, these kids are so perfectly quaffed. Like, I know a lot of people get harsh on slashers because everyone looks 30 when they're supposed to be playing teenagers. Mm. And I'm officially broken. I don't see that anymore. Mm -hmm. People are like, dude, look how old these kids are. I'm like, yeah, I don't see it. I'm so broken. I'm glad I'm not alone. No, (laughs) We're so desperate for slasher movies. We don't give a fuck anymore. (laughs) Exactly. Let's see. Um, I really enjoy the the conspiracy of um, Springwood trying to keep. It's a, it's a whole thing in the plot. It's just great. Mm. It's them trying to kill Freddy by making people forget, and they've been effective. It's been working with a few mild side effects. With one of the guys who um, they escaped from the um, Springwood, the well, the, the asylum anyway, he's saying, and he kind of has a you know. A, holy shit, I dropped the ball moment. He was like, we, we were in a fucking quarantine. And then like two minutes later, it's like, oh God, did we screw up the town's plan? <laughs> like the, well, the fear contagion loose. And the Freddy contagion even. I'm looking at, I get, I'm going to get a lot of these. We have the main, the main kids yeah. in this movie. And then there's, there's the characters that I'm going to actively mix up. Oh God. Even yeah. though I just, I spent like an hour last night reading uh, the Crystal Lake Memories, that book. Oh yeah. I, read the Freddy versus Jason uh, section of the book and it is long and it is detailed and even after doing that my brain is like who are actors oh yeah well um, uh, like you said about uh, Catherine Isabel I had to go through all the pictures on IMDB to like she said oh she's Gib I was like god who the hell was Gib and I figured yeah, yeah she probably was the you know the girl who's always drunk and all of that but um, yeah the, I had to uh, one... confirm that <laughs> I'm gonna use this guy in the artwork because holy shit this guy uh, one of the dudes, I think it's Blake's dad. 
Mm. Um, he looks exactly <laughs> like Alex Jones. Yes, I'm so glad you said that. Oh I'm not my alone. <laughs> god! <laughs> Holy shit! His name is Brent Chapman. Is this actor? Let's see if he still looks like. Do you him. think the, uh, the yes. hypno- Do you think the the hypnocil in the town is turning the frogs gay? <laughs> Turn the freaking frogs gay! <laughs> Fuck, dude! I, I I had to. Ooh, got some thunder. It's a very nice. stormy day here. Ooh. Um. So yeah. I, I just can't believe how much this poor bastard looks like Alex Jones. <laughs> Sorry, what was his name again? me up. Brent Chapman. Right. He's been acting up until 2019 as well. So he's been in a lot of TV stuff. But man, oh man, it, when he pops on the screen, I just laugh. And he gets his head cut off. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that could be worse. Mm. Oh, my God. Um, this movie thinks we're idiots. Uh, there's a moment where... Uh, Freddy shows up and Freddy hasn't gotten all his powers back because people don't believe in him enough. And he reaches out with his claw, a shadow claw, to kill this kid. Mm. And he misses, or rather, the claw just waves over and the shadow just kind of brushes against him. And he's like, oh, I don't have my powers yet. Which he explains. But then the movie, the screenplay goes a step (laughs) further to say, to have him run away going, I'm all right. (laughs) And I'm like, fucking show don't tell you fuck, 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 right? oh Ugh. my god yeah okay like okay folks to compliment new nightmare again just because i was harsh on new nightmare and i'll never recover from it <laughs> it has like a doctorate in smartness oh yeah this movie has like a doctorate made with like its own poop <laughs> like it tried to like smear poop on a paper and go me doctor <laughs> There, uh, we'll talk about the too many cooks in the kitchen and just the uh, silly yeah. dumbing down of this movie. I started writing on a zigzag and didn't get past the abstract, probably. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bob Shea is on hand once yes. again. Bless his heart. Oh, man, we need Bob Shea in every movie. I don't care if it's Freddy or not. I he was Bob underused in this, man. Did he even have any dialogue? Well, he might have done. <laughs> if it seemed like did, two they, second. If they did, they cut the shit out of it. <laughs> it was gone. They hacked at it. Mm. Um. I love the research part. We got, uh, let's see, do, do, do. Let's get these people going here. Uh, Jason Ritter, son of, uh, uh John yes. Ritter, which is amazing. He plays Will. He and his buddy, Mark, played by Brendan Fletcher, uh, they are in an insane asylum because they remembered Freddy. Mm. So, uh, the town sequestered them and has g- been giving them this drug called Hypnosil. And they, <laughs> <laughs> sneak out they get out there's a gratuitous butt shot from uh brendan fletcher he uses his butt to distract the possibly gay guy who runs the uh, <laughs> the asylum he gets out they get out together and they immediately go to the freaking microfiche machine and start researching and see that the town has literally redacted their newspapers mm. instead of just tossing them all away and burning them and destroying them. No, they've literally had some freaking unpaid graduate student at the library redacting all mentions of Freddy from the newspaper, which they probably had to shoot that guy in the head afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so fucking stupid. But I love it. I love when people go to microfiche. Yes. Uh, <laughs> then we have a rave scene. Oh, and, this uh, uh, might be my fuck. favorite part of the movie. Jesus. Holy poop on us it, this is insane there is no i don't think there's a rave sequence on film in tv film on tv or movies that isn't dated Ra- people do not understand raves or something you know i had a double take i thought this was what you is that you, burning man that you have over there i thought that's this oh, was that at first. <laughs> okay folks if you're a listener to this show and you've been to burning man just write it and explain yourself <laughs> i have friends from from high school and from college who post their pictures from burning man and i don't i feel emotions Mm. when i look at their pictures and they're not positive (laughs) they're not happy emotions i'm just like what the fuck are you doing (laughs) i'd go to burping man like uh, a burping contest? Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> anyway. Now, I don't know about you, man. I was kind of a bit mystified by this rave uh, in an, another way as well. <laughs> by, um, you know, it's like... Oh, fuck. <laughs> what? No, no new metal? I mean, you know, it is a cornfield after all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. We, we played with a band once, 
that uh, they were new metal. It was so amazing. And the dude, he was wearing these long baggy shorts. This was in like 2013 too. And he, he put his freaking leg up on the uh, on the monitor like to, to scream at the audience, you know. And they were talented. They were super talented. But he had the biggest corn tattoo. Like it, it was it, almost his entire calf was covered with a corn <laughs> tattoo. Uh, th- that's when you have to do your poker face. Like you have to, or as I call it, the Burning Man face. When I mm. see pictures of Burning Man, I just lose, you know, I just go cold. <laughs> but yeah, th- th- so... <laughs> Fuck. Uh, we have uh, Captain Glowstick, the neon rapist, <laughs> t- takes advantage of uh, Catherine Isabel being passed out drunk. Notice there's no drugs at this rave. Mm. It's just like Everclear, Everclear. and booze. Wasn't Everclear which... a band as well from like around then? Or a die? It's I starting that? to show up again in Florida oh. because Florida, maybe we don't give a fuck anymore. I don't mm-hmm. know. Oh right! You can you can stuff. still get like a hundred and fifty ridiculous proof. You can get freaking grain alcohol around here. It's ridiculous. Rectified spirit. Mm. Rectified. Uh, damn near killed him. Oh that god! Was, that yeah. was a terrible. Please kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Oh don't don't worry. If it makes you feel any better, I've got another one here about the uh, glow stick guys. Like you know, thinking got enough glow sticks, bro. And it's like, oh right, you're a bro stick, are you? <laughs> I think his penis is a glow stick. Oh, boy. He's got to shake it up. He's got to <laughs> crack it and shake it. <laughs> oh, Why did I go there? Uh, so the movie couldn't afford Jason Mewes oh, uh, no, uh, from, 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 from Jay and Silent Bob. He should have fucking sued. Yes. <laughs> I feel so bad for this actor. He. Oh, my God. Let's see. Uh, what is his name? Oh, God. Is it Freebird? Oh yeah, it's uh, yeah. His name is Kyle. His name in the movie it's it's Bill Freeberg, but he's played by Kyle Labine, mm. and uh, he's the stoner character. And they literally have him acting like Jason Mewes, and I feel so bad. It's it's cruel. Mm. Oh my god, it's so bad. It, no fault on the actor at all. He does his best, um, and he has a great moment. He kind of gets redeemed later when he gets oh uh, yeah yeah possessed by a uh, fatty. Mm. or freddy i guess uh, this this makes me this movie makes me love halloween resurrection so much more oh yeah yeah because this this and that film have the same stupid ass broken charm mm-hmm. uh for me halloween resurrection is way more charming mm. uh this this is at moments this movie is just punishingly embarrassing <laughs> other things i love though about this movie the coma patients uh, people overdosing mm. on uh, hypnosil end up in the comas. Oh, yeah, that's oh, creepy, that bit. So good. I love it. That's another thing that the movie explains real stupid. It's like just just little things you could fix in, a, in just dialogue. Just no, like hypnosil. This is what happens when you overdose on it. And I'm like, gee, I go away. Okay. Mm. Just mm. little tweaks. Like that's the thing about this movie. It just has little things that would be so much better if they just... Ah, whatever. I'm, I can't believe I'm nitpicking this poor movie. Well, it, it's probably a case of, I don't know, too many cooks or too much. I mean, as we'll get into, I, I didn't realize, um, and you, by the sounds of it, it's probably why the bit in the book was so long, you know, the inception, you know, or uh, conception of this or whatever, <laughs> kind of goes back to like uh, 1987, I think. I mean, yeah, it's wild. It yeah, it's it's yeah. really wild. Uh, but I do love the mechanics of the story. I love the way they finally got Freddy versus Jason. It's freaking mm, great. Yeah. Um, this is a very dynamic film. Mm-hmm. There's bringing that Hong Kong aspect to it. Oh, yeah. I love all the, the um, Dutch angles and stuff and all the tilts yes. they were throwing in. That was great. And all the wire work and just yeah. the stunts. The stunts are outrageous. When Freddy comes flying out of the water, when Freddy just he's, he's supposed to be drowning Jason and he comes flying out of the water, it's like an iconic shot. It's yes. so great. Oh, my God. Then there's this whole thing with the main girl. So let's talk about our pal Lori Campbell, as played by Monica <clears throat> Kina. Uh, Monica Kina is she's pretty great in this movie. I like her. There's stuff in this I do not understand. Uh, like she had to be a virgin, which is amazing. They were like, "Hey, there's always a virgin in these movies. Let's make sure that her virginity is part of this plot because she's been pining over this guy." Uh, 
uh, Will for years because he just disappeared. <clears throat> Once he talked about Freddy, the town made him disappear. And she's they were 14 when he disappeared, so she was just pining over him. So she never – she's been holding out. Yeah. She's been waiting for Will. Mm-hmm. And uh, I – hey, I don't blame her. He's still on my list to uh. take my virginity. <laughs> Hey, do we think a, a name is a, a kind of uh, conscious hat tip? To Scream? Hmm? Oh, no, to Laurie Strode. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I'm thinking of... Why did I say Scream? Who oh, the fuck worry. is named Scream and Laurie? <laughs> what? Oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh-huh. I hit the... Uh, I hit the fucking... I was flogging the dolphin before we started. <laughs> why uh... was flogging the dolphin on that list of marijuana slang? <laughs> Yeah, folks, well, go back and listen to our Idle Hands episode. This permanently destroyed the quality of this show. It's but, flogging, flogging the dolphin, it makes you sound like you're pr- uh, possessed by Fappy Kruger or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ji Jean, Ji Jun, turn away. Ji Jun, turn away. You don't want to see this. I don't. You know what, though? I think hmm. Jason spares masturbators. Yeah? Yeah. What makes you say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Why did you ask? Just, just, just an instinct, you know. I just don't know. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, they take the Freddy thing and they combine it with the virginity thing. So we have Freddy threatening to take Monica's virginity with his razor clawed hand. Hmm. That ain't right, brother. Nope. That's a that's like, man, it's almost like Freddy's some kind of a molester. Hmm. Oh, no. We're, we still haven't doubled down yet, folks. We still oh, haven't. No. We still haven't doubled down on. Yes, Freddy is not a freaking uh, child murderer. He is a absolute molester. That hasn't happened yet, hmm. but it's gonna happen. Oh yeah. Oh boy. So I'm uh, kind of. I say unusually for me. I didn't take tons of notes on this. Maybe because I'm a bit less familiar with this one, and I was kind of also half. You know, watching it while trying to take notes, of course. Right, but one right. of my uh, last notes uh, is just metal in block caps, <laughs> like three exclamation marks, which kind of sums up some of it. But uh, dude, it's great. Yeah. So many freaking just chunky, chunky freaking mosh riffs. Oh I love yeah, it. yeah. Uh, thank you, Pantera. Like, there's an interview <laughs> with Pantera, and I think it's Phil and Selmo is like, hmm. well. What if we do the cool part, the whole song? <laughs> because it ruins the cool part. You've ruined coolness. Mm. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I can't harsh on Pantera. I loved them yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. So the moment, best moment in the movie when Will and Lori and their buds manage to bring Freddy into the real world. Hmm. Robert England is such a treasure. He looks terrified <laughs> when he realizes that he's no longer in the dream world and he's got to face Jason yeah. on his own terms. Dude, oh my God. It is so, what a, what a wonderful moment for mm. freaking Robert England. I love it. Yeah. Ugh. But then that guitar kicks in, the metal, <laughs> like you said. <laughs> so we have two lines. Two lines of dialogue back to back that are wretched, <laughs> that will not age well, even if this movie's a thousand years old. Freddy goes after Kelly Rowland, oh uh, boy, you know from Destiny's Child, and then she's she's gonna taunt Freddy. Um, he says, "One of these I won't repeat. I'll repeat this one because it's fucking outrageous." He says, "How sweet dark meat." <laughs> no, no. No, 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 no. It doesn't work. <laughs> I know they're trying to make Freddy the bad guy and make him even more repulsive. Mm-hmm. And it's just pull the plug on that shit. That line would never land now. No. Unless Freddy was literally known for being a racist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, was a, he was a child racist. <laughs> but then... She comes back and calls him the F word. She questions his his heterosexuality. And it just, man, the air just gets sucked out of the room <laughs> when she says the F word. It's so bad. No, oh, no, boy. no, no. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> uh, last couple of notes I have on this. 
Uh, the the gore is outrageous. Mm-hmm. I am so glad they pushed the, the envelope on the gore on this movie. <clears throat> this was a time where PG-13 or or die was happening. Yeah. And so it was really nice that not only did they make it really gory, I don't know. I didn't read any trivia about them running into problems that with the MPAA coming down on them for anything. So no. granted, it could always be bloodier. Every movie could always be bloodier. But this is just grotesque with Freddy hacking away at Jason with his claws and chunks of flesh are flying. Mm. It's great. I think uh, hopefully anybody, you know, who was sitting over, you know, uh, sort of passing judgment on that, like the censors or what have you, uh, would just say just how blatantly, you know, not in a bad way, but kind of cartoonish and just yeah. blatantly over the top of it is. You know, you'd have to be stupid not to, really. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think that's all I have. What other, uh, do you have any other notes we missed, sir? Did you... Uh, no, I think that's pretty much everything. Just let me double check very, very, very quickly. Oh, I oh go on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought of the, 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 the whole moment in the lab mm. when they're, uh, they're trying to put Jason to sleep and they're trying to get Hypnosil, vice yeah. versa, I think. And they end up with the crazy stoner seeing the worm, the oh, Freddy worm that yeah. possesses him. It's ridiculous. That, that scene in the theater that whole sequence just made my jaw drop i love that whole bit mm, and all you mm. know that that the town conspiracy thing is is, is just oh i love it the, but the thing is when uh freeberg <laughs> gets possessed by the uh the freddy he he his look on his face when he's gonna take on jason it's so mm. good and then his death is amazing he gets the whole uh oh what was that oh the sleepy hollow treatment oh he's yeah yeah freaking yeah. cut in half uh, I think they borrowed that bit a little bit. Mm. And then, um, what's the other thing? Oh, uh, yeah, Kelly Rowland, when she gets killed, that that kill was weak when Jason uh, kills her. I was like, um, yeah, she gets thrown up against the tree. I was like, whatever. Uh, I did like the nerdy kid. Uh, yeah. The nerdy kid. I forgot to mention him completely. I oh. forgot to mention a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easily done. Uh, was this what was he called? Is he was it Linderman? Linderman, Chris, Chris Marquette. Yes. Uh, yeah, I thought he was he was good. I mean, he had a great moment of giving uh, Kelly Rowland shit at the at the rave. Yeah, and was kind of totally. calling her out, which was really good. And, uh, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't really well written, but he told no, her off. Yeah, but his death. Yeah. I liked his death a lot, where he mm. just kind of like, no, go ahead. I'm I'm gonna be fine. You go on, and he knew he was mm. dying. That was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I agree. Uh, but yeah, so let's talk trivia, dude. Unless mm. you had another note. No, that was it. Okay. Uh, let's talk th- now. Like I said, we've dropped a few, a few trivia bits here and there, a few chunks of trivia chunks. But dude, this movie, the so the the, the genesis for this this movie started like you said in like the eighties, <clears throat> uh, but then they doubled down on it in. Jason versus uh, Jason versus hell. Yeah, great. Uh, Jason goes to hell, the, the iconic shot of the Jason mask and Freddy's claw coming out of the ground and taking it. That the audience reaction to that moment. Hmm. I don't know how the I don't know how the audience reacted to Jason goes to hell. Um, <laughs> I react to it very positively, but not hmm. a lot of people do. No, no. And <laughs> so the, the audience going bonkers over that shot is what sealed the deal that made new line very interested in this thing now it mm. took several years to get it going yeah um there was as at least 17 different scripts holy shit and 12 different screenwriters if the book uh, crystal lake memories is to be believed hmm. this movie the initial screenplay they had it at like two and a half hours oh my god and then apparently the original ronnie you cut was over two hours before they decided, no, 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 this is not, yeah, that's not going to work. We got to get this down because, yeah. What did we end up with? Uh, it's sh- about sh- an hour and 35, something like that. Yeah, nine, 97 minutes. I would yeah. not have had a problem with this being 105. Or yeah, 108. sure. Like, you know, just to, just to get some of that, let's explain it real fast crap out of there. Hmm. Um, but apparently, like you're saying, Ronnie Yu was a bit of a bastard. Mm. Uh, he's a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> emotional on set. He gets very dark depressions, apparently, oh. according to the the people he worked with. Right. Um, his command of the English language was was coming along. It was not really great. Mm. Um, apparently, the 
He just said, um, oh God, I read it a thousand times. It was like the more intense, more intense or, uh, his, 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 um, direction to the actors was just like hmm. bigger, bigger, more, more. And so mm. they were like, I'll edit that to not sound so fucking stupid. <laughs> That's uh, but, uh, he got it done and he got it done for way under the projected budget. Hmm. Um, they were talking about this being a $60 million movie. Yeah. And he said, no, I'll do it for 30. Wow. And they're like, yes, please. And so he did. He got it around 32, 33. And it was, this movie doesn't look cheap at all. Oh, God, no. This was a huge budget. And it, it also made a shit ton of money. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. It was this would guarantee. Yeah. Million. This guaranteed the remake train years down the road. Like this mm. would <laughs> without, you know, this because uh, Jason X was a huge disappointment, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were nervous about this. But uh, without this, I don't think we would have had. The Nightmare on Elm Street remake, and we—I don't think we would have had the um, the Friday the Thirteenth remake no. without this. At least not as soon as we got them, which you know, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, whatever. So the the list of directors that this could have had. <laughs> oh yeah, one of these was uh, interesting very to cool. Me. Mm. Uh, Guillermo del Toro. Oh wow. Rob Zombie was offered. Yes. yes. But he was doing uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Thank God. Mm, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't Guillermo del Toro. I'm sorry. Uh, it was Peter Jackson. Ah. Peter yeah. Jackson was asked and said, uh, no thanks. Mm, no thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the plot elements I really liked uh, was there was going to be a, a cult of Freddy. Uh, somehow a group of teenagers had developed this this fascination with Freddy Krueger and had they were trying to resurrect him on purpose for some reason. Uh, that's that's the, all I got from the book was that there was going to be a Freddy cult. So there's going to be cult members running around, mm. sort of like the druid thing from uh, uh, Halloween 6. Oh, yeah. I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like that idea. I'm, I'm yeah. glad it didn't make it, but it was neat to read about. Oh, didn't they talk about, yeah, saying early drafts, they were considering kind of connecting the paths of uh, Freddy and Jason. But um, what's this saying? One considered twist was that Freddy either raped or had consensual sexual encounter with Jason's mother and as a result had unknowingly fathered Jason. What? Um, yeah. Uh, there's more here. Wow. What's this? Another twist considered that was that Freddy had worked at Camp Crystal Lake in the past and had either molested Jason as a child or was somehow connected to his drowning, being a child murderer and potential sexual offender, thus giving motivation, Man. blah, blah. But yeah, you know, they figured it was too contrived, which is right. And also kind of just too dark for the tone, really. You know. Wouldn't be too dark for the next movie. Oh, oh boy, no. <laughs> but yeah, this was a very grueling shoot with all the stunt work and everything. Um, it was really cold. They shot this <clears throat> in Canada. Somebody was supposed to be in this. Oh, uh, Brad Renfro. Oh, yeah. Uh, Brad Renfro was supposed to play Will's character, uh, but they took one look at him when he showed up and said, nope, nope. Brad Renfro has has a very bad, um, I mean, he's he's since passed away. Hmm. Uh, he had a lot of uh, substance abuse problems. Right. In fact, he died only five years after this oh, came God. out. And he, yeah, he showed up and his his agents were trying to convince them that he was cleaned up. And nope. When he showed up for meetings, he just, they said he looked like a bum and he looked like he was, you know, 50 year old man in a Jesus. 20 year old body. It was, it was really sad. I had to look really up, sad. I had to look up who he was and I didn't realize. And uh, just some of the movies he's been in as well. Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, aside yeah. from obviously uh, the client being a child actor, but uh, sleepers and uh, flipping uh, was out people. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. It, it's, yeah. Ugh. They had to quickly cast somebody, and they, they called in this guy, Will, who's he's very good. Mm, mm. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, there was a um, – I didn't get a chance to watch it, of course, uh, well, this time, but uh, there was a commentary, I think, on the Blu-ray. And in some ways, it probably would have been quicker for me to watch that than to <laughs> scroll through the flipping trivia here. I mean, Jesus. Two stunt perform- the performers – Two stunt people who doubled for Monica Kina and jo- Jason Ritter, their wigs were melted mm. because of the the crazy fire sequence, the the heat there. Oh, that's a deleted thing. Uh, there was a whole subplot about them trying to develop Crystal Lake. Oh uh, yeah, they had some yeah. La- some shady land developers there, which is why there's this rando construction site for the big fight scene at the end. Ah, and it's so funny how much they chopped this movie up. They don't even show the sign long enough for you to read it. 
Mm. Freddie looks at the sign that is clearly this company talking about the future of Crystal Lake and what they're going <clears> to <throat> do and develop here, but they don't even show it long enough for you to read it to understand why there's all this construction materials there. And I'm like, God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> I would literally be interested in a, would it be a producer's cut or director's cut? I don't know. Mm. Like I would literally love to see this at that two hour cut. Just yeah, for be interesting. Shits yeah. and giggles, man, mm. because I don't, you know, sometimes I wonder, <sighs> everyone raves about certain cuts of certain movies being better like alien three yeah um the producer's cut of halloween six mm-hmm. and i don't see the appeal of them no. this, is a, this is a case by case basis i would um with those two i would I'd, I'd agree with the assessment of the um director's cut of alien three being better but i would not with the producer's cut of halloween six yes, i'll say that much thank you <laughs> yeah and, I, and I, it's a case by case basis yeah exactly i'm glad these things exist my mm. brain can handle the rob zombies because Rob Zombie, he often shoots himself in the foot with the director's cut. Mm. or two, He's kind of two for two with that. Yeah. I do not like the director's cut of either Halloween or Halloween 2. I prefer yeah. the theatrical for both of those. Now, there's stuff in both of them that I wish there was a, a fan edit. Yes, yes. Or I, you know, in, in my copious amounts of free time, I'll make <laughs> a fan edit there. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, there's, it's so funny. Mm-hmm. That, that we we are blessed to have these things, but I'm still like, <laughs> I want more. <laughs> now, I'm finding the behind the scenes stuff about what was going to be in scripts, what's going to be in the final versions of the films. Yeah. I always find that stuff really fascinating. Now, I like all of the, you know, could have been's. That happened with with uh, the various cuts of things, the various versions of screenplays. So I highly recommend uh, you read through the trivia here. Um, and dude, I'm telling you, um, Crystal Lake Memories. I don't know how the 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 movie version is. I have not read. I'm not. But I have not watched the movie version, hmm. the the documentary, the film documentary, um, Crystal Lake Memories. I'm kind of holding out until. Hopefully one day we'll do a super show mm. of the Friday the Thirteenth series. Yes, uh, Brad Brad Hogue, Brad, yeah. mm-hmm. Brad, because Brad and I did the Halloween one years ago, mm. and we did that in one sitting. Holy shit! Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, we don't do that crap anymore, <laughs> folks. We we split this up. We do a couple conversations over a course of several weeks, and then you know. mm. put it together seamlessly, seamlessly, seamlessly. <laughs> So that's Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, let's go ahead and drop in a teaser trailer or a shortened trailer for uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake from 2010 because, good lord, trailers are annoying now. <laughs> but I just I love a good trailer and, well, we don't get them anymore, so here we go. I'm starting to dream with my eyes open. Whoa! I can't tell what's real anymore. If I sleep, I'm dead. Wake up! One, two, Fred is coming for you. If you die in your dreams, you die for real. A Nightmare on Elm Street starts April 30th. Okay, that was the probably irritating trailer for the Nightmare on Elm Street pre-make. I refuse to call them remakes. They're pre-makes. Mm-hmm. No, one, no one's going to start doing that. I should stop it. <laughs> uh, so this was directed by Samuel Bayer mm, uh, of the Bayer Aspirin Company. Uh-huh. Probably not. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say something. Bear, um, bear, bear ass? Oh, Bayer Aspirin. Uh, this dude has... Continued, holy fudge, 90 directing credits. Oh, it's music videos. Oh, ah, music video director. That explains a lot. Mm. Okay, let's sort this. Well, Garbage, Green Day, Aerosmith, Pat Benatar. Holy fudge. Let's look at movies. (laughs) Did he stick with horror or did he? Oh, I don't think he did. (laughs) Nope, he did not. He said, no thanks. I got it all out. I'm good. I'm going to read the plot from the uh, Hell, Hell, 
I'm <laughs> reading the plot from hell. This is the <laughs> New Line Cinema DVD. Five teenage friends living on one street all dream of a sinister man with a disfigured face, a frightening voice, and a gardener's glove with knives for fingers. That's interesting. One by one, he terrorizes them within their dreams. When the rules are his and the only way out is to wake up, but when one among them dies, they soon realize that what happens in their dreams happens for real, and the only way to stay alive is to stay awake. That kind of repeated itself. Hmm. Buried in their past is a debt that has just come due. To save themselves, they must plunge into the mind of the most twisted nightmare of all, colon, Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Thank you. Jackie Earl Haley plays the legendary evildoer in this contemporary reimagining of the seminal horror classic. <laughs> Color, 95 minutes. Oh, here we go. Widescreen version presented in a letterbox widescreen format preserving a scope theatrical exhibition aspect mm. ratio enhanced for widescreen TVs. Ooh. Dual layer format, brother. Well, that works. Oh, you missed the most important bit. 30% hmm. post-consumer recycled content. <laughs> Just like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about this Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Uh... Holy shit. Mm. <clears throat> oh, you know what we didn't do it last time? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit this in. Yeah. How do you like Freddy vs. Jason? You know, uh, like I said to you, I hadn't seen it in, God, a good number of years. And I, yeah, I'd always enjoyed it before. It's not one I felt particularly, for whatever reason, compelled to rewatch until we were talking about doing it. But I think it held up really well. And it was, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, to say one or two, maybe I'll advise uh, things aside uh you know it's his age pretty well and yeah i enjoyed it and i think th i think i could see myself revisiting it much sooner than i did last time yeah and other things like again just appreciating you know the the visual style of it and oh uh connecting uh that to this uh both shot in that um what 235 to, uh, to one aspect ratio which i don't think in either franchise you know we'd had that before oh, wow. as far as i'm aware oh wait no no i'm wrong um there was one friday the 13th film i think part three that was shot in uh, in scope i think wasn't it i god i cannot remember <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it was i'm pretty sure i'm right about that i trust you i thank you i um, trust you <laughs> oh and also yeah because i watched these like you i watched them um, as a double feature i think they pair together very well in fact you know with some of the plot and some of the uh just like kind of similarities kind of almost uh Almost kind of uncannily, so it's kind of a perfect double feature, really. Oh, nice. Hmm. Uh, I I do like Freddy vs. Jason. I I, I like Ronnie Yu. Hmm. Um, I I haven't seen enough of his films. I really, really can't wait to rewatch The Bride with Right ha Right Hair, The Bride with White Hair. I need to see um, that. Oh, you will like it. It's hmm. it's great. Um, I remember the sequel being kind of that. He didn't direct the sequel, right? Uh, but he, like I said, he brings that Hong Kong charm. Somehow he brings that freaking weird uh, slow motion mm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Hong Kong cinema, folks, if you know the term for this, it is where they show things in slow motion, but they're sped up. Right. It's yeah. a very unusual effect. I'd love to know the name for it. Um, it's something I noticed the first time I ever saw a Hong Kong movie. Hmm. And some Hong Kong movies really overuse that effect. It's really funny. <laughs> and even a film as late as, um, God, what is it? Kung Fu Hustle, mm. uh, Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle. <clears throat> they were still using that exact same technique for, for slow mo. It's like, uh, it's like a weird, it's like they're trying to create a fast montage with slow motion. I have literally no idea how they're fucking with the frame rate. It's just very strange. Yeah, I had, um, God, I think I had a copy somebody sent me of something once where it, yeah, it, it, it had gone like that. It was somehow both sped up and slowed down. And I was like, how the fuck does this work? It just, it kind of broke my brain. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm glad you, you brought, running you back up because there's a couple of things I did forget to mention um mm. yeah uh, bride of chucky i'm intrigued to rewatch yes. that. Uh, i've not me seen too, it in me years. too years always enjoyed that uh and the film i don't think i'd realized he directed i'd even forgot about this called uh, the 51st state i don't know if you're familiar with 
which has um, yeah, kind of a weird movie and probably looks <laughs> very kind of dated now from 2001. Uh, it stars Samuel L. Jackson and Robert Carlyle. And we've got this, what's this? American master chemist plans to score big on a once in a lifetime drug deal. All does not go. The mm. synopsis it doesn't make it sound as kind of as interesting as it is in a way, but it is kind of a bit of a weird what? film. You have uh, Meatloafs in it as well. Um, yeah, strange, strange movie. Dude, yeah. Oh, it's uh, the American title is Formula Fifty One. Ah, uh, yes, yes. What Formula Fifty One? It's some kind of I forget now. It's some kind of like somehow like the most amazing drug ever or something. Uh, and he's dude, gonna, I'd like, watch that. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was fun, but um, I don't know. Yeah, it'd probably just be a bit of a weird time capsule though. No, I don't. I don't know. Oh, what's this? Oh, yeah, we got a quote. He's explaining his drug. Yeah, utilizes serotonin, opiates like heroin. Utilize dopamine, sensation you get after sex. Uh, bloody bloody blah. Oh, fifty one <laughs> times stronger than co- cocaine. Fifty one oh, times more hallucinogenic than acid. Blah 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 blah. Oh um, lord. Yeah. Like you'd want. Like you'd want that. <laughs> exactly. Fucking. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have to watch that. Yeah. So another Ronnie Yu uh, movie I saw many years ago is uh, uh, Hong Kong has a history of comedy horror films. Mm. Uh, they, I think they just green light every fucking script if it's a comedy horror film. Mm. Mm. When you're looking for horror in Japan, you find a lot of movies you just can't find. Yeah. When you look for horror movies in Hong Kong brother you get them all mm. but 90 percent of them are comedies and one he did was called the occupant right with uh oh nine- i'm looking i'm looking right at his face and i cannot remember his name 1984 oh chow yun fat thank you oh my god i'm like chunky monkey man <laughs> whatever chunky monkey man he probably doesn't want to be called that yeah i like Freddy vs jason it really is insultingly stupid mm. Uh, and that's okay. That's okay. I, I like to be insulted. I'm a kinky. I'm a kinky guy. I like that. No. I saw it in the theater and it was just a joy in the theater. Liet and I were, mm. I think we we're dating at the time and we both were just like, well, that was great. Mm. You know? So it's a, definitely a crowd pleaser, mm. which is why it made so much damn money. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. So back to the remake. Okay. I would love to know who shot this freaking movie. Mm, Who is yeah, the cinematographer on uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake here? This is a gentleman named Jeff Cutter. He shot uh, some very pretty movies. He shot 10 Cloverfield Lane. Uh, he shot Orphan. That's the ones I know best. They're they're very uh, attractive movies. I get a lot of uh, music videos as well, I think. Music video people, man. Mm. Uh, the cast in this is pretty damn good. Mm. I like. I think I like everybody in this movie. Um, I'm especially uh, into uh, good old Jackie Earl Haley as yes. Freddy Krueger. Uh, <laughs> people hate his performance, and mm. people hate his makeup, and people hate this movie. But whatever. Uh, hate is gonna hate, man. Yep, that's true. Um, I like Rooney Mara very much. Mm. Rooney Mara. I have. I totally forget that she's in this. Oh, me too. Every yeah. single time. Um, I also forget Katie Cassidy, even though she's on the damn posters. <laughs> uh, Katie Cassidy, I don't. I think I like her. I have. I've not seen her on um, Arrow or The Flash. I know she's very popular from those. Yeah. Uh, I'm scrolling through her career. She's in Black Christmas as well, isn't she? The uh, 2006 oh one. God. I mean. She's in... Yes, she is. Thank you. Oh, my God. How did I forget that? God bless America. She is great in uh, Harper's Island. I completely oh, forgot I to watch she that. was freaking in that. Um, I recommend Harper's Island. I would say it's an episode too long, mm-hmm. but that's the worst thing I can say about it. Mm. Brad turned me on to that. Brad was like, have you seen Harper's Island? I'm like, no. He's like, just buy it. And I'm like, okay. And I bought it sight unseen. And dude, I had no regrets there. Cool. Uh, she was also in When a Stranger Calls. Oh, uh... She wasn't the main yeah. girl. How, how is that, by the way? I only finally got to see the original uh, late last Dude, year. Dude, that's another one where Brad's like, uh, what do you mean you haven't seen it? And I'm like, eh, it didn't look very good. He's like, nope, you need to see it. Cool. He's like, it's good, it's solid, they did a good thing, and yeah, I think nice. it's really good. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll talk a little bit about remakes when we... <laughs> Mm. when we get to this thing Mm -hmm. uh let's see uh clancy brown uh he plays 
the principal or a teacher who's also the uh, father of one of the main characters, Cal- yes. Clancy Brown. If you don't like this guy, you got problems. Oh, God, yeah. He's almost hit 300 credits. Holy shit. Yeah. He rules. Yeah. I love him so much. The voice, just everything about him is great. Wait, 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 wait. Is he the voice of Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob? Apparently, that's what it says. Okay. Uh, <laughs> folks folks at home, if you could pick up my brains, they just hit your roof. Because <laughs> my fucking head just exploded. I never knew that about him. That's bonkers. What? <laughs> I feel like I'm being gaslit by fucking... Uh, by freaking IMDb, that's great. I had no idea he had so many voice acting credits. So that's, that was kind of new to me, to be honest. Man, uh, he plays the father of a character named Quentin, who's our our final boy, mm. um, played by Kyle Gallner, uh, whose name I never knew until just now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a really good actor. I like him. Mm. He's he's a cool dude. So the mom in this, uh, Nancy's mom, is played by uh, Connie Britton. Oh, who yeah. I know best from, uh, she was in something horror. My brain has just erased the title. Oh, American Horror Story. Oh, was she in the, um, was that the first, the, yeah, it was the first season. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She, I, I can't believe I couldn't remember that. <laughs> yeah, I really like her a lot. She's mm. fun. The folks who wrote this, I'm looking at the screen players here. Uh, Wesley Strick and Eric Heiserer. Mm. I probably just butchered that name. The one dude, Wesley Strick, he worked on freaking Cape Fear. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of remakes, that's funny. Uh, he also worked on Wolf, which uh, I've been trying to trying to build up the courage to watch Wolf again. Mm. I hated Wolf when it came out so much. I've only seen it once, and I actually enjoyed it. To be honest, people love it, and mm. I'm I would I just need to get over the peeing scene. All oh, right, I when don't he remember pees, that. when he pees on what's his face. I just I wanted to die. <laughs> Uh, he wrote a guilty pleasure movie that I've since gotten out of my house, uh, Glass House, oh. or The Glass House with Lily Sobe Sobe. All right. That movie, I was like, that was great. Mm. That was so good. And I tried to watch it again. I'm like, this is too creepy. <laughs> this freaking grown up Stellan Skarsgård freaking drooling over Lily Sobe. I was like, I'm out of here. Oh, boy. Sorry, Diane Lane and fucking Bruce Dern and all the other awesome people. I got a bail. This is gross. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Eric Heiser. Rah, 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 rah. Ooh, he wrote a very. He was involved in a very good movie, mm. uh, Arrival. Oh, oh yes. wait, yeah, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Oh my god, dude, Arrival is so good. Still need to see that. Uh, he wrote Lights Out, which I've heard was okay. Mm. I've never seen it. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. Speaking of remakes mm. that I kind of don't mind, but also wish I, it didn't exist, was the Thing remake. It's perfectly fine and serviceable. I don't really yeah. have a great desire to rewatch it, but, you know. Yeah. We don't. We didn't need to know what happened. No. In the other installation. We didn't need to know how the story started. It's, it's part of the thing is your imagination will scare mm. the shit out of you, so... Mm-hmm. I, d- I definitely don't hate it, but yeah, well, and like I said, Simon, we're going to talk about remakes for a moment after this, when we get to it, when we get to it, when we get to it. So let's get into my notes here. I don't have a whole lot. I took way less on this than I did with the other movies. I'm the other way around with, uh, well, not oh, the other good. movies, but with, um, compared to Freddy vs. Jason anyway. All right. Wow, wow, wow. Um, like I said, this movie shot beautifully. I mm. love the the pretty diner. Yes. I love the pretty, everything is just super pretty in this movie. Right off the bat, though, problems start to arise when they show Freddy way too soon. Mm, mm. Now, for people who hate the makeup, <clears throat> I would give them credit and be like, yeah, yeah, they, they show it too soon. They should have been hinting at it because it's creepy. I don't, I, his makeup is, I find it very unsettling. Mm. The, the, the more realistic burn victim thing. And you can tell it's kind of difficult for uh, Jackie Earl Haley to speak, mm-hmm. but also someone with horrible burns to their face would also have some trouble speaking. Yeah. The things that I don't like that this movie does is when it replicates the stuff we've seen. The more famous stuff from Wes Craven's original, it's dicey. Sometimes like the body bag scene works, yeah. but then the... The Freddy with the rubber wall is a complete failure. Yeah, I um, 
I'd remembered that for sure. That was the thing that stuck out. But rewatching mm-hmm. it, because I think I've seen so many weird effects in kind of the later films in this series, I was kind of a bit more kind of forgiving to it, I suppose. It's like, yeah, yeah. it does. It looks weak, but it's also of you kind of being kind. You could say it's kind of interesting in, in a way that when <laughs> when you get to rewatch in Twin Peaks Season 3, oh boy, somebody take a shot. I've mentioned Twin Peaks. Um, oh no! <laughs> yeah, some of the effects in that, man. Yeah, you'll see what I mean. They're kind of... I mean, oh boy. Some of them are fucking outstanding, but other ones you can like... Summer. Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the, the Showtime money showing its uh, threads there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, this is... Yeah, I still... I can't... I cannot with that wall scene. I, uh, there wasn't... There is another scene later that's not in the original film, but it's it feels like something they tried to do where uh good old Nancy's hiding from Freddy and he magically appears in the closet beside her. Mm. It's a bad jump scare. Yeah. I loathed that shot from the theater in my second viewing. I loathed that shot. Suddenly this time I was like, oh, that was that was perfectly fine, that mm. shot. It's still not smart, mm-hmm. but whatever. Uh let's see. Um this is not a subtle movie. Uh, this 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 is like a brick to the face, mm. um, it, but not any. It's not as dumb. It's heavy handed, but it's not stupid heavy handed. It just it's like we are doing this. Bah. So there's a lot of like I guess just overdone things, less subtle, but there's still some subtlety to the movie. Yeah, and what you were um, before I forget what you were saying about how they kind of requote things and um, reuse things. I was reading in the trivia they were saying they were trying to, as you'd expect, you know, it's a homage, but a lot of people just felt they were straight off ripping them off, and it really shot them in the foot. I think in that sense. Oh, okay. Which is it's a shame. I uh... That I didn't pick up on. That's interesting. I'll have to think. I'll think about that next time I watch it. Yeah, I mean, I um like especially later on how they end up quoting dialogue, and they even kind of end up. I'd call it kind of as much a remake, almost like a remix, how they're taking elements out of not just the original, but some of the sequels and kind of throwing them together, you know. Nice. Hey, they really would have gotten in trouble if they started having dream warrior shit happening. Like, (laughs) I'm a powerful person in my dreams. Like, uh uh-oh. I wrote in my notes that the cops in Springwood all look like stuntmen. Yeah. They did not bother to have any actors as the cops, and they're so funny. Like, the cop just screams, shut the fuck up! (laughs) At uh, Jesse, is it Jesse? Jesse, Jesse, of all people. Mm, Played by Thomas Decker. He played John Connor in the Sarah Chronicle, Terminator Sarah (laughs) Sarah Chronicles. Dude, dude, emphasis on the chronic. (laughs) Oh, fuck. We're done. What's this next to it? He's in a film called Kaboom. The poster for this looks amazing. What the Is that an fuck? orgasm? Is he having a kaboom in his pants? Oh, he definitely yeah. is. Yeah. I am going to die. <laughs> that was the same year as this. Oh, we need to do more research, folks. So, folks, we're going to go. We're going to go watch Kaboom. You can sit here and wait for us to finish <laughs> watching Kaboom. He was in an episode of Elvira's movie Macabre from 2011. And look what film it says here. What? Lady Frankenstein. What? It says he's credited here as Elric stroke Jack Shimansky, apparently. I am going to have to watch her new series. I am such a hardcore fan of her original 80s mm. uh, show. I have not watched her new show. I did like when they were looking for her in that reality show. Oh, right. Where they had all the different, uh, you know, women <clears throat> and men trying to be the next Elvira. It was, whew, that was a fun show. Cool. It was one of the only reality shows that didn't leave me feeling disgusted with myself for having watched it. Mm. I mean, I'm always disgusted with myself, but that's usually over uh, Jason Goes to Hell. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, oh, with my, speaking of eye rolling, uh, how about that Giga Blast? Oh, um, Did you pick up on the Giga Blast? Oh, it's ringing a vague bell. Help me out. I'm blanking. It's their Google. It's their, yes. Uh, yes, I did. their yes. Yahoo search engine. It's called Giga Blast. And of course, you don't hit search, brother. You blast off. <laughs> Gonna blast, blast off, off with Giga Blast. <laughs> what a shit show. Oh, wait, I said that too loud. Hold on. Gonna blast, blast off, off with Giga Blast. <laughs> There, I'll use that take. That was the other one. Was, I tried to I tried to turn away from the mic, but then I screamed at the top of my lung. <laughs> Doesn't really work with a sensitive microphone. Oh, hey, boy. sensitive guys mm. have sensitive microphones. Mm. And my dick. 
<laughs> this movie has so much style, dude. Mm. I kind of love. Okay, I loved it, and then I hated it, and now I think I love it again just for the freaking style. Yes, that music yeah. video shit works. It, the music video director is always fucking prosper in the Freddy series, dude. Mm. Mm. Oh my god, the snow in the bedroom, the snow falling in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah, that, the, I, the, oh. mm. yeah, that was uh, kind of very. I mean, there's some kind of slight variations on some of the famous scenes as well, and that the whole um, consult my notes here. So I'm sure I wrote about that. Well, I'll just back up a bit. I mean, yeah, like you're saying from the off, I sure. mean, this was only my second viewing, and the first one was, you know, probably when it first came out on DVD. And yeah, it was kind of a revelation, especially to see it in high def, because like you say, I mean, that diner. Just like the facade of it, how colourful it all is, and it's raining, yeah. and you know me, I'm, I'm big on atmosphere, so straight away, just the mood of this, and just how kind of um, weird that kind of diner feels, kind of in the interior as well, kind of, um, I don't want to say claustrophobic, but just this, this kind of a vibe going on. Yeah, just the, the weather helps with that, and yeah, like you say, the, the, the snow later on, that's kind of a nice, kind of new touch. The, the snow scene doesn't even make sense. Mm. It has nothing to do with anything, but mm. I'm glad it's there. It's yeah, so good. yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, uh, we've got another conspiracy to uh, to cover up the thing. I mean, obviously, there's always been a conspiracy of the parents trying to hide the crime that they did when they killed Freddy. Mm. But this one feels even more like a uh, cover up. So I I got some because uh, I watched them back to back like you did. I got those uh, those vibes from Freddy vs Jason and this one totally. And yes, finally, we have doubled down. We've officially said that Freddy Krueger is a pe- is a pedophile. I hate this, mm. but I understand why they're doing it, and I think it's something important. And it, folks, don't don't misinterpret this statement at all. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to sound like an asshole more than I normally do. Mm. I don't know how folks who are victims uh, of of that crime. That horrible thing that 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 adults do to children. Mm. I feel about movies that portray it. Yeah, um, and this one certainly does it in a complex way. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't know if it's a positive thing to see this portrayed on film for folks. I'm assuming that it's better than never talking about it ever. I think it was only a matter of time, really, that they were going to do it because it's always kind of been implicit. Yeah, and it's it's handled. You know, I think with a degree of sensitivity and, you know, I like how they, they kind of, um, I mean, they kind of kept me guessing with it because at first there's almost this yeah. implication that maybe, you know, they were saying, oh, we were just, you know, the stories we told, you know, do we even know it was true or was it just all taken out of hand or all that? I thought that was. See, mm. I find that really strange. The whole mm. red herring thing is yeah. like, yeah. did he or didn't he? I'm like, what were they going for? That's very interesting. Like, but that's obviously the kids who were subjected to that, mm. they're going to be in denial. Yes. Yeah, that's they're not going to want to face this. And when they finally face it, it is it just leaves you cold and mm. dark in a very dark place when yeah. they finally find Freddy's quote-unquote cave where the children say he took them to and did things to them. And it's, yeah. it is um, bleak and mm. dark. So, yeah, it's I, I kind of give him props, but... It's just, it's just, there's a lot of strange things going on here with that. Mm. The only thing stranger than that is micro naps. <laughs> Dude, if the thing with micro naps is so funny, if they called it something else, I think the people who strongly dislike this film would have less ammunition, <laughs> but that might be literally a scientific thing that they, that there's a, maybe micro naps are real. I'm not even going to Google it. I love it though, especially... <laughs> <laughs> just, just whenever they ha- they say micro naps, I just put the subtitles on. I just start taking pictures of my TV in disbelief. <laughs> I fucking love it. I'm googling. Well, no, actually, I tell a lie because on my search bar I have. I don't know you're familiar with DuckDuckGo, which now is making me think of Gigablast for some reason. <laughs> and it's coming up with. Uh, I'm researching them. <laughs> micro maps, Micronesia, and Micro Nappies. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, benefits of micro napping. If you take. A micro nap in Micronesia, you might like shrink down to where people couldn't see you, like Lily Tomlin did in The Incredible mm. Shrinking Woman. Mm. I've been waiting like over 200 episodes to make that <laughs> reference. Thank you. And I don't know if you guys have seen that. I don't know if you've seen The Incredible Shrinking Woman. No, I have not. It is one of the most existentially terrifying films <laughs> for a child. I was, God, five or six when that came out. Mm. 
it scared the bejesus out of me the, the thought of shrinking out of existence mm, oh my while God. your loved one while your loved ones are like baffled is what to do man <clears throat> god it's a good thing i don't have human emotions that would have <laughs> gotten to me so did you find anything on micronaps or just micro oh i did yeah i mean i, I got on here uh, we had benefits from micro napping from life hack but i just was pulled to this one more <laughs> the second thing the power of micro naps from the art of manliness Oh, uh, no. Nap like Salvador Dali. Get creative insights on the boundary between sleep and wakefulness. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I think I think life hack that should go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so this leads to the drugstore scene, which is Ooh, one yes. of the freaking brilliant, totally yes. original moments where Freddy is just pulling Nancy in and out, or excuse me, Nancy is just falling asleep while awake. And going in and out of these dreams yes. while Freddy's coming after her, while they're trying to get some more hypnosil. <gasps> no, <laughs> freaking good old, uh, good old Quentin's been on uh, uppers since he was a kid. Oh, he's on some kind of like it's not Ritalin, it's something kind of like that. I think is it. They said to like yeah. speed for people with AD, AD, ADHD. <laughs> and sure enough, the uh, the chemist. Uh, ooh, I'm I'm officially a British person. I called him a chemist. Ah, oh. uh, the. Uh, now I can't remember the American word for it. The chemist <laughs> <laughs> won't give him the drugs. It's awesome. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of scenes I liked in this, but that might have been kind of the the kind of standout scene for me. Yeah, I just love the uh, transitions between you know like the uh, the shelves and the boiler pipes and just everything's framed and you know uh, can dissolve together. It is yes. perfect. Uh, my last note here is um, my standout scene. Uh, second, and this the only one that beats out the freaking. Uh, the drugstore is the hallway carpet. Oh yeah, yeah. So Nancy's running from Freddy. She runs on the hallway carpet, and you've been kind of waiting for the stairs scene mm. from the original, where the stairs just turn into pudding and freaking <laughs> <laughs> plaster or just nasty shit. But instead, they do a little switcheroo, and she steps on the freaking carpet, and it folds up and then turns into waves of blood, and she mm. falls into. And dude, I, God bless the actress for putting up with this bullshit. Man, that looked really unpleasant. Yeah, to fall into that pool of blood. That and then the scene that just oh, it just kills me is when she falls through the ceiling. Yeah, into back into her bed and that slow mo, that hyper slow mo CGI of the blood, like a blood waves and everything. Like oh my. God. God, mm. and then she's in that dress. She, she's magically <laughs> transported into one of those white, like little girl dresses, and of course that gives Freddie even more chances to be creepy. Ooh. Oh God, yeah. But what else you got? What else you got in this, these fine sequences? <clears throat> okay, so you have to bear with me a minute here because I have a lot more notes and I have to. No, fuck them them you. <laughs> fuck you. Won't bear with you. Of course, of course. <laughs> oh, so yeah, we were saying about some of the jump scares. I thought, like at the funeral, you know, the um, there's some good, good fake outs, kind of little jump scares, what have you. Oh yeah, and you you mentioned the like the body bag bit. That was well done. That kind of generally startled me, you know, when she kind of opens her mouth with the blood yeah. and everything. I thought that was really that kind was of creepy. Good. Mm. Did didn't need any CGI to make that fucking no. terrifying. No, not at all. Uh, the bookstore scene, I thought that was pretty well done. Oh, the jail uh, bail stroke bit, the the bail fake out. So it's like, yes. yeah, why why is he getting bailed out for fuck's sake? I, should, I kind of should have seen that coming. But again, just how it's framed, you know, the corridors and uh, with the boiler room, just you know, kind of like um, yeah. prefiguring the uh, the bit in the the pharmacy, really good. Oh, did you see one of the books in um, that pile that Jesse's got? Um, you know, part of his research, he's got. Um, I didn't check this, but I'm pretty sure I was right about yeah. this. Um, said uh, boiler rooms of America. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah, I did man. not catch that. I need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't, I'm not, I need to re-familiarize myself maybe with the tale of the Pied Piper, but who was he making that shit up about, you know, the whole, were they just kind of elaborating that for their own purposes for the movie? I, I'm not entirely sure, but it, it worked anyway, I thought. That I don't know. I'm not sure. I mm. had uh, I had Lieta sitting there, so she was much more uh, literary than I am. She did mm. not pick up on it. Mm. So it could just be stuff that's from the old story. Mm. Cool. Oh yeah, I've got the word micronaps written a few times throughout my notes because, <laughs> like you say, you just you, 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 you you've turned that into a meme or something there, sir. I think uh, rightfully so. Oh, that shot going into the was it 
school photo that was pretty cool kind of good um for you know at times some of the effects being a bit ropey that was a really good one i like the how they've kind of changed nancy in this and they've made uh you know she's not as kind of you know she's a lot more kind of socially awkward this and that she's an artist so she's exactly. kind of set up as kind of a you know a bit of a kind of visionary i suppose you know been able to kind of see or sense things maybe before um yeah. other people uh, i like how they quoted the bath shop but then they didn't you know they kind of second guess it and they transplant the kind of being pulled under the water bit into the you know the bit in the swimming pool with um was it jesse yeah well, that was pretty yeah, that good, was good. Uh, like, like I mean, especially mm, when he reappears out in that industrial area. Yes, yes, brilliant, absolutely. Um, oh, there's some vlogging, and the bit at the end of that made me flip and jump. I think you mentioned that. <laughs> oh, again, yeah, we've lots of quotes here, you know, from various sequels. What this hell's this for a wet dream? Uh, so on and so forth. There was <laughs> wow, one I think I missed. Yeah, like I say, they're kind of remixing and kind of combining the callbacks and stuff, which I like. You know, it's kind of a better way of doing it than just taking, say, from just the original. Oh, and yeah, uh, the final shot, man. Jesus Christ. Oh, that song they use. Where is it? Is it first in the. They use it in the credits. Is it that Everly Brothers song they use in the pharmacy yes. as well? That was really good. Beautiful. Mm. Man, that was good. Yeah, okay, I think that's pretty much all of my notes anyway. They're just gonna hey, go. they just gonna get more and more like spaghetti towards the bottom of this page. Yeah? <laughs> uh, well I do have to say this has so much frickin' trivia. This almost rivals Freddy vs. Jason, I think. Oh boy. This this has so much trivia mm. shit, it's crazy. The reputation for this movie is pretty bad, especially among yeah. the people yeah. who are in it. Uh, Wes Craven, of course, uh, he has <clears throat> disowned the whole thing. He said that he was not approached about the remake to be involved, and so he was like, fuck you. Yeah. Uh, um, Rooney Mara <clears throat> hated this movie yeah. so much yeah. that she wanted to quit acting, uh, but she does not show it, man. She's no. so good. The uh, She's a professional, man. Mm-hmm. She's, mm-hmm. like you said, the whole, I love her character being the, this outcast and the, 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 the tension between her and Quentin and the romantic tension. He's like... Why won't you go out with me? Why come you never even told me you like me? And she's like, I can't. Mm. Like she's like, I'm too weird. You know, it's like, man, that's, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's kind of turned on his head from the kind of usual sort of gender sort of thing, I suppose. If that makes sense. <laughs> Jackie, Ear- <laughs> Jackie Earl Haley said he was apprehensive about taking on the role of a child molester for about a minute and a half. <laughs> I guess I <laughs> so let me weigh the let me weigh the financial thing here. Let's see. Let's see. The uh, bit at the top of this is true, Nick. This is again just uh, my my deep dive research here. Sorry, how fucking IMDb. The top thing, which if this is true, it certainly is the most interesting item as it has been voted. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah. About what's this? Johnny Depp accompanied his friend Jackie Earl Haley to auditions for the original. Instead of Haley being chosen for a role, it was Depp who was spotted by director Wes Craven. I seem like to read for a part, and yeah, it does. That's true. That's yeah. crazy. Jackie Earl Haley has an insane career. Mm. I had never noticed him until Watchmen when he played Rorschach. Yes. yes. And then I saw this. And then I'm like, hold on. His credits go back to 1972. Mm. So he's been doing this forever. Yeah. And good on him. I mean, dude, like, talk about sticking with it. Mm-hmm. Can just, I'm just trying to imagine him as like in uh, the original Nightmare on Elm Street as Johnny Depp's character. I mean, maybe he was auditioning for something else. Mm-hmm. But it's like that, like Jackie Earl Haley th- heartthrob, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. It's like, a, yeah, there's a t- another timeline's branched off there, I think, and there? He's in a uh, movie I, um, when I was on a bit of a um, Charles Band kind of kick recently, you know, which trances and all that. He's in a film I've not seen, but I really want to see now. Especially now I've been reading more about the plot and his, uh, you know, getting prepared for this, about his role in it. Uh, he's in mm. Do- Dollman. Really? Yeah. What year was that? 1991. I'll just uh, look up, see what it said on, I think it was on Wikipedia that got me intrigued about this. And just, it seemed like it synced kind of uh, interesting. Oh, the really. Albert oh, Pune. Yeah, this is what blew my mind. Right. Yeah, Albert Pune. Yeah, that crazy guy. Um, Holy shit. So let's see here. Oh, what the fuck's happened now? Sorry, sir. Wikipedia's gone into Wikimedia. Uh, like you say, directed by Al Pune, starring good old Tim Thomason as the space cop Brick Bardo, also known as Dollman. He is only 13 inches tall. And get this, Bardo is equipped with his Kruger Blaster, which is the most powerful handgun in the universe. And his, uh, his enemy, funnily enough, is played by Jackie Earl Haley. 
Let's just add that to our episode list right now. Yeah, man. You and I will cover Doll Man. That's cool. fucking brilliant. Nice. Wow. This was originally intended to be a prequel, mm. but the idea was dropped. So they were going to do the the origin of Freddy, which kind of explains the the, the flashbacks being so good yeah. when we get to see. And Jackie Earl Haley, man, he nails it. He's mm. so good as 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 Freddy in makeup and the character before because he's such a slime ball. And you immediately, when his cries for help and his, his pleading with the the parents, the mob, yeah, it makes you feel like maybe they got the wrong guy. Well, that's you know, it, like exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that. Uh, here you go. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton and mm. Steve Buscemi were considered <laughs> to play Freddy Krueger. That's a lot of baggage right there. I am genuinely <laughs> afraid of Billy Bob. Yeah. He is terrifying. <laughs> Holy shit. So this is uh, what's well, just underneath that. Uh, well, a bit underneath. Uh, so Samuel Bayer turned down the offer to direct twice. Previously turned down several other Platinum Dunes films, including the Amityville Horror and Friday the 13th remake. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. According to IMDb, adjusted for dollars, this is the eighth all-time highest grossing slasher movie. Mm. That's nuts. Yeah. That is wild. It I'm is. I'm surprised yeah. because when I saw this in the theaters, I went that night and just wrote this glowing review on my blog. Mm. And by the next day, I was like, should I print a retraction? Because mm. the vehemence that the fans had for this, I think this was, there's something about the 2010s that people didn't understand, or like late 2009, is maybe they could have just put out any horror. Mm. Maybe they didn't have to do remakes. Because mm -hmm. all these remakes were making money. Yeah. For the most part. So maybe they just could have put anything horror. Maybe the people just wanted some freaking horror. Duh. Mm. But yeah, this was a thirty-two million dollar movie, much like good old, uh, mm. good old um, Jason versus Freddy, mm -hmm. uh, Freddy versus JJ Brown. <laughs> this made a hundred and fifteen worldwide. That's pretty great. Mm -hmm. uh, this was supposed to be a, a trio of films. Uh, Jackie Earl Haley signed up for three movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, for of this of this series and Rooney Mara signed up for two mm. <laughs> and nope 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 we're not getting those sequels well she's probably glad that they uh, because essentially what seems to have happened is that the fans and the critics killed any uh, possibility of there being a um, kind of follow up to this and maybe in terms of doing features maybe Samuel Bear's career I don't know did he, he really do any features after that I couldn't see it seems like he's gone back to doing um, I'll have to look Music up again videos. yeah yeah, yeah. Ooh, the Blu-ray has a bunch of extras I want to check out. Oh, cool. Uh, a lot of deleted scenes. Oh, yeah, I'd be interested to check Alternate that. footage, yeah. Oh, you've no doubt heard of Freddy's Revenge, but what about Freddy's Second Coming? Oh, boy. Oh, baby. That will get very interesting and wet. Speaking of a wet dream... <laughs> Uh, so um, there's, I think there's a quote from here. Uh, it says, uh, "What's well, this? Forget the long rumored reboot of the franchise." Oh right, England believes now is the time for a full remake of Freddy's Revenge. So yeah, forget the long rumored reboot. The Ruba Oh my god, I'm losing it. Reboot losing of the <laughs> of the franchise. Freddy Crawl. Cr oh, god, god. Freddy Krueger. It's just so. It's just so well written, dude. <laughs> He's called on the movie gods to revisit the second entry in the Elm Street series. Right, quote. The secret of Nightmare on Elm Street is the loss of innocence and the kids need to be Midwestern kids. They can't be hip, cheek, junky kids. They have to be middle American <laughs> kids that think they're a little hip and they are co-opted by evil and lose their innocence on all levels. Sexual violence, murder, death, realisation of their parents' flaws, all of those things. But because our society now is more damaged because of the opioid crisis, because of incredibly diverse, because of... Uh, the openness now with gender and sexuality. Those kids now have to be different than the kids from the original Nightmare, and someone has to write a different batch uh... of kids, and Freddy needs to be a different kind of evil. His evil needs to be... He needs to toy with what they like in the culture. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. sure. Fair Why right. not? Hmm? Do it, do it, Mountain Dew. Oh, sorry, I think there's more here. Uh, right, so if they redid Nightmare 2, for instance, and really deal with the subtext, Freddy toying with that boy's sexuality... 
But the fact that we're much more comfortable with that now, I think it would be really fun to have Freddy play with one kid who's gay. Maybe one boy is not, play with them, tempt them, force him out of the closet or back into the closet and we can do that. Which I think, you know, that kind of happens in Freddy's Revenge anyway, I think. Yeah, um, I, don't, I think I think they could do this way more subtly. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's what they're not going for. If this, if this project ever gets off the ground, it would be the least subtle one. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, that's and speaking of, and uh, maybe he's alluding to that. So yeah, audience will set that now. And Freddie would do that because he's in your head, but it's going to take somebody very clever to do that. So yeah, it could be, it could be interesting. Who knows? Hey, I'd watch it. Yeah, me too. Uh, this film, the remake, is included on Roger Ebert's most hated list. Oh boy. Oh man, that that I'm quaking in my boots. <laughs> Sorry. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> hey, when it comes to horror. When it comes to slashers, I don't want to hear from Ebert ever. <laughs> Around 15 different drafts of the script were written. The final film is a hybrid of four of them. Oh. <laughs> Eric Heiserer, uh, who was listed as a co-writer, has stated that there's very little for him to recognize of what he's written in the final film. So. Oh, God. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Robert England says that... Uh, he gives a general approval of the remake mm. as he felt the story could be better told in 2010 with the use of CGI and other special effects that were not available in 1984. Mm. Uh, in spite of the lukewarm reception, Jackie Earl Haley's version of Freddy Krueger has been used in many video games such as Dead by Daylight. Oh. So you got to think that the the dude knew what he was doing at the time. Like totally. when, they, when they worked on the design work, when they worked on the design work, <laughs> when they worked on the design, they kind of knew what they were doing. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that's I think that's enough of that. Mm. There's dude, there's so much. This is funny. <laughs> I, I felt like I wish there was a book. There probably is, folks at home. If you know, please write in and tell me mm. if there's a book about the entire Nightmare franchise that's comparable to the Crystal Lake Memories. I'd love to read it. Um, there's probably a book about uh, Freddy's Revenge that's very good. Uh, but yeah, I've never read, I've only read that one that was so highly detailed about the first book. So, mm, mm. Uh, so how do you like this one? Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, you know, you hate to say almost after this two viewings if you love something, but I think maybe, you know, I mean, like I say, just on kind of mood and atmosphere and uh, kind of some good effective horror sequences alone, I, um, yeah, I was, like I say, even from that first scene um, back in the diner, I was, I was totally into it straight away and let's say from my uh first viewing i um i didn't recall disliking it or anything i just didn't remember too much about it i suppose um but the copy i think i saw wasn't maybe tremendously brilliant so that may not have helped but uh yeah just on the level of visuals alone and um all of that yeah yeah really uh can't can't wait to rewatch it again already yeah, I'm I'm also uh in the like almost love. I it this was really taken aback, especially with the performances mm. and as we talked ad ad nauseum, it just is a beautiful, beautiful movie. Mm. Mm. I feel bad that uh they really got slammed yeah. for, for not making it more original. But I'm like, it's a fucking remake, what do you want? Yeah, I I mean I kind of Slightly agree, but also I th I think I'd written down in my notes. I thought this is this is to me is a remake done right. You know, it's like yeah. having some differences and some variations, but also kind of tipping your uh, you know your fedora to the original as well. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I loved it when I saw it in the theaters. Couldn't believe people hated it so much. Mm. Mm. And uh, I did a video where I watched all the 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 Freddy Cougar ah, yes, movies yes. in a row, the Freddy Cougar movie thon, mm. and uh, I was so done by the end of the day that this just fucking pissed me off so <laughs> if you're gonna watch this for the first time i recommend not watching every freddy krueger film in a row before it it's not gonna help mm. uh but yeah this this is definitely gonna be something i revisit as well oh uh, man uh let's talk about remakes for oh, just yeah. a quick yeah. minute i get there's too many remakes mm. there's been too many remakes for many years now now and if i've talked about this on the show and you guys are sick of me talking about this <laughs> enjoy it again Hmm. remakes have been with us forever they're gonna keep happening but i don't hate them all i like them on a case-by-case -case basis hmm. my least favorite remakes are usually asian horror remakes they tend to uh take everything good about them and just dump them yeah i'm looking at you uh the pulse remake oh somebody lent me that i've still not watched it i'm gonna give it a shot i couldn't get through the opening 
kill. I was like, this sucks. Hmm. But I'm going to try it. I'm going to literally give that movie a chance. Plus, it's got uh, Veronica Mars' girl in it. So, hey, oh, I'll right. watch that. Cool. But, uh, yeah, this like, I think the Thing remake is one that just is on that list of why does this exist. Yeah. Um, but, but remakes like the Friday the 13th remake, this remake, uh, the aforementioned uh, When a Stranger Calls, mm-hmm. Black Christmas remake. These are things that add something to it. Um, I still think this version of Nightmare on Elm Street adds something to it. Yeah. Comparing them back to back, maybe I'll have a different, you know, a different opinion. But I, yeah, I, I did not get that vibe that this is just a carbon copy. No, no, not at all. Not at all. So, uh, but yeah, remakes just, hey, they're not, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not, they're not going to stop. I mean, for God's sakes, they made a second Black Christmas remake. <laughs> They remade Black Christmas a second time, mm. and although I liked it, had a good time watching it, people loathe it. Oh, like, forget yeah, how much yeah. they hated the 2007 one. People are done, just done. Oh, God. Yeah. And I can't, I can't argue with them. I mean, it's, it's, it did not need to happen. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> it has stuff to say. It has, it has a message to it, but hey, you know. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I hear it's different, so that has me intrigued, you know. Yeah, but, um, you, you're mm. the type of person who will go into it. With an open mind and just mm. be like, well, I watched that. Or, yeah. you know, worst case scenario, that's what you'll come away with. Like, add it to my my bedpost notches. <laughs> I don't know. Do you do you do that? Do you, like, have a big piece of wood that you <laughs> r- rub when you watch something? <laughs> well, that, de- that depends. Uh, I don't have any bedposts, though. So, yeah, I have to use my own big piece of wood. Like you oh, you wore them down. They're now toothpicks. <laughs> exactly. Too, what too, too, the fuck am I talking too, about? Too, too much abuse there. Oh, my word. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. But yeah, dude, I, I think um, for every freaking remake that makes it to theaters, there are five billion other movies that are made that didn't make it to theaters. And mm-hmm. the problem is not the fans. Even if you and I and everybody else boycotted these things, there's still people going to the movies that aren't quote unquote horror fans. Like mm. like the people that are casual horror fans, they're still going to go see these things. So it's okay. never going to stop remakes from happening i wish that the studio system and the theater system wasn't geared towards like however many we have very few like studios left that get to they have the money to get these things in theaters they have the money to advertise uh what what you got to do is go see the shit that has nothing to do with anything yeah exactly go see gretel and uh, when, a, when a movie like gretel and hansel comes out go see it you oh, know man, i'm still so pissed off that I didn't get any uk distribution and that's the thing i was mm. shocked yeah I was shocked that uh, an Oz Perkins movie like came to my theater. Mm. The one that that I'll never forgive myself for was the Black Coat's daughter was in the theaters. Oh boy! And I found it by accident. I'm like, oh, I heard that was kind of good. Mm. And then I read it. And I was like, oh, it's a possession movie, meh. And so I passed on it mm. because I that's one subgenre I'm freaking burnt. I'm toasty. Yeah, like a freaking big old blunt, <laughs> like a big <laughs> chronic full of blunts. <laughs> what? That I just didn't want to go see it. And now I'll never forgive myself for not just getting off my ass. I had nothing else to do. Just freaking spend the money. Go see this movie. You don't know what the fuck it is. Mm. One day when we're, when theaters are dead, if they ever do die, I will love to read a book detailing what happened. Mm. Like what the hell happened to the theater system? Like. (laughs) Well, yeah. you know, I mean, aside from just the models of things already changing with, you know, Netflix, so on and so forth. I mean, obviously, <laughs> the time we're in currently, I mean, people are asking those questions. I mean, long term, we don't we don't know what's going to happen with it. We just hope that oh. you know, we will be, be able to still go out and see things in theaters. You know, touch yeah. wood. Mm, speaking of bedposts, <laughs> I mean, my dream is to just buy an old theater mm. and renovate it. And uh, just show movies yeah, and just have a BYOB, BYO fucking cheddar cheese. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to sell concessions. Mm. I'm going to just let people bring whatever they want to eat. People can order a pizza and have it delivered while the movie's playing, you know? Bring, I don't care. Bring your own blunts, you monkey freaks. Yeah, let people have their cell phones. Who gives a fuck anymore? <laughs> just, just, I'll just have a theater and just show weird shit. Mm. Like, just get, pay the rights to just show, because... Eventually, and that's the only time I see the reason for a 4K Blu-ray player, a 4K mm. is to actually have a small theater and show movies on a 4K. I don't, I mean, I'd love to rent 
film, like real film and mm. show it. But the likelihood is, is that I won't be able to afford it. I've been to several great screenings where it was so obvious they were just using the Blu-ray. Mm. Mm. Like, oh, well, that's what they're doing. And it was fine. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, there's a tangent for you. So oh. in case you were wondering <laughs> why we're not wrapping up talking about Freddy Cougar, uh, because, dude, we are not done. We, Simon and I, from the very beginning of this madness, when we started talking about <laughs> A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, we realized that we didn't want to neglect Freddy's Nightmares, the series. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get through that, mm. uh, but we're going to do a very light and breezy discussion of the freddy's nightmares series as a way to wrap all this up yeah so what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, how we rank the films and hopefully i'll finally finish reading the freaking novelizations holy shit oh yeah that's what i was looking at before a lot of stuff i got Mm. a lot of i got a lot of work i should have put into this show but i'll never do no i'm just kidding (laughs) so yeah we're gonna we're gonna save this we're gonna we're gonna put this discussion on the shelf for a little while and we're going to talk about uh, how we rank the films after all this and then we're going to talk about any mind-blowingly obvious trivia that we missed if you want to write in and talk if you listen to all three of these episodes and go guys hello you forgot that nancy was played originally by a polar bear that's why they had (laughs) snow in the sequence in the remake (laughs) dumb shits Please let us know what we missed. We'd love to talk about any trivia that we skipped because we were trying to not die. We're going to talk a lot about Freddy's Nightmares. I'm really excited to rewatch it or just watch more than the one or two episodes I've actually seen. Yeah, I still haven't seen any of it. So yeah, I'm excited. Oh, shit. Mm. Yeah, I understand that there's episodes that are directly to the mythos Mm. of uh, of good old Cougar Mm -hmm. and directly tie into the films. And then there's the episodes where he's just... The boogeyman who punishes sinners like a, like a proper slasher villain, like going after people who do drugs and all that stuff. And <laughs> cool. I'm sure there's some very questionable episodes we're going to hit, so it's going to be fun. <laughs> Indeed. But Simon, thank you so much, dude. This is I obviously this is a labor of love, or else we wouldn't have spent like collectively <laughs> like so. Fuck. What have we done so far? Seven hours of show? I don't even know how many hours of... Probably more. Probably more. We certainly record more than we release onto the world because (laughs) um, we often just read our our erotic poetry. Mm. 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 I like uh, the freestyle. (laughs) You've got to go and take a break and uh, go and uh, massage the bedpost. Flog the dolphin. (laughs) Exactly. Fuck. Ah, well, folks, thanks for listening. Simon, I'll thank you again. Thank you again. Oh, always a pleasure. And, uh, folks, take care. We'll be back. Mm. Probably not talking about Freddy, though. We're going to talk about something else. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Bye. This is The Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is The Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show. Use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.